why in the world should we assume that the topic of your book, the title of your book, refers to something that is real? And and if it's real, why aren't we attending to it? And why is it important? You know, I th I, well, first of all, it's real uh, because in all 56 of the largest developed nations, boys are falling behind girls in almost every single academic subject, um, including reading and writing, which are the two biggest predictors of success or failure, as you can probably imagine. Um, and so, and, and, and boys who do badly in those subjects are much more likely to drop out of high school. Boys in general are much more likely to drop out of high school, especially in the United States. And boys who drop out of high school are more than 20% likely to be unemployed in their 20s. Um, this is a statistic before COVID uh, when the unemployment rate in the United States was 3.4% uh, versus more than 20% for, for boys. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to be talking today with Dr. Warren Farrell, who I spoke with three years ago, almost to the day, about his previous book, Why, it, Why Men Earn More. We're going to talk today about The Boy Crisis, which was published just after our last interview, so that's in 2018. Dr. Warren Farrell was chosen by the Financial Times as one of the world's top 100 thought leaders. His books have been published in more than 50 countries and in 19 different languages. They include the New York Times bestseller, Why Men Are the Way They Are, which must be a very thick book, plus the international bestseller, The Myth of Male Power. His most recent is The Boy Crisis. We mentioned Why Men Earn More as well, which is a very good book. His most recent is The Boy Crisis, as I said, 2018, co-authored with John Gray. The Boy Crisis was chosen as a finalist for the Forward Indies Award, which is the Independent Publishers Award. Dr. Farrell has been a pioneer in both the women's movement, elected three times to the board of the National Organization of Women in New York City, and the men's movement, called by GQ magazine the Martin Luther King of the men's movement. He conducts couples communications workshops nationwide. And he's appeared on over a thousand TV shows, that's way too many TV shows, and has been interviewed by Oprah, Barbara Walters, Peter Jennings, Katie Couric, Larry King, Tucker Carlson, Regis Philbin, and Charlie Rose. He has frequently written for and been featured in the New York Times and other major publications worldwide. He has two daughters, lives with his wife in Mill Valley, California, and resides virtually at www.warrenferrell.com. As I said, we spoke three years ago, it was May 6, 2018, just before Dr. Farrell's book, The Boy Crisis, was published. We'll concentrate today on this book and associated topics. Hello, Warren. It's so good to see you. It is so good to see you more than normal, Jordan, for all the, you know, it's not we've had more than the boy crisis. We've had the Jordan Peterson crisis, obviously. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, a very I, dull topic that <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it's just amazing to me that during this process um, of you going through what you went through, not only with yourself, but with Michaela, with Tammy, that you're not only alive, but that you're also that you also produce an extraordinary book um, as well in, the, in that period of time. It's, it's just beyond me. No, thank you. Yeah, well, it helped keep me afloat. So I've been reviewing the boy crisis in in quite a bit of detail over the last few days. Um, it's, it's something I haven't thought about for a while. Uh, certainly, I've thought about it since our last conversation. The world has twisted and turned in all sorts of strange ways since then. And I suppose this issue has been pushed, this particular issue, the boy crisis, let's say, has been pushed to the back burner in a major way by all sorts of, well, cultural movements and by COVID. And it's not precisely on the radar. You mentioned to me just when we were discussing this issue, for example, at the beginning of our conversation today, before we started taping, that uh, President Biden established a White House Gender Policy Council, which is supposed to focus on gender issues, but in your opinion, pretty much only focuses on women and girls, and is also supposed to focus on race, but pretty much ignores black boys, which is perhaps the intersectional place, to use a detestable phrase, where the crisis is the most um, noticeable. So 
why in the world should we assume that the topic of your book, the title of your book, refers to something that is real? And and if it's real, why aren't we attending to it? And why is it important? You know, I, I, well, first of all, it's real uh, because in all 56 of the largest developed nations, boys are falling behind girls in almost every single academic subject, um, including reading and writing, which are the two biggest predictors of success or failure, as you can probably imagine. Um, and so, and, and, and boys who do badly in those subjects are much more likely to drop out of high school. Boys in general are much more likely to drop out of high school, especially in the United States. And boys who drop out of high school are more than 20% likely to be unemployed in their 20s. Um, to, this is a statistic before COVID, uh, when the unemployment rate in the United States was 3.4% uh, versus more than 20% for, for boys. Um, and so that's just the academic part of it. On the uh, mental health part of it, uh, when boys and girls are nine, they commit suicide about equally and very minimally. Between the ages, ages of 10 and 14, boys commit suicide twice as often as girls. Between the ages of 15 and 19, they commit suicide four times as often as girls. Between the ages of 20 and 25, they commit suicide about five times as often as girls. And most people don't even know this, pay attention to this, but this is only the, the tip of the iceberg of the mental health issue. Um, there's you know, where boys are far more likely to um, die from drug overdoses, opioid overdoses. Uh, they're far more likely to be uh, depressed if you measure depress depression in a way that includes male symptoms of depression, um, much, uh, much more likely to um, be, uh, enter into um, a, a, to, uh, place, places that that take care of people who are um, uh, mentally uh, have mental problems and so on, um, and and when boys and so I started asking myself, you know, what what causes all this, you know, and and when I first submitted uh, the boy crisis to the publisher and sort of um, in form a proposal, I outlined ten causes. Um, and those causes included the environment and schools and so on. Um, but I kept coming back to realizing that the hub cause of the boy crisis uh, was, uh, uh, was dad deprivation, that the boy crisis resides where dads do not reside. And so that um, got me really thinking about that. So for example, boys um, who are raised by uh, moms and dads together um, and go from a, an intact family to a school that has very few male teachers, there's not a huge impact, a little bit of an impact that's negative, but not much. But if they go from a female only um, home environment, have only a female role model, that, then they go to a school with almost no male teacher role models, uh, they are much more subjected to, uh, much more vulnerable uh, to being seduced by gangs as a, as a pseudo family, or trying to not having the postponed gratification that dads tend to bring to the family. And so therefore without that postponed gratification, they're more vulnerable to a drug dealer saying you can make you know, money really easily um, by dealing drugs. You don't have to worry about getting the best grades in school and you'll, you'll prove everybody that you're, you know, you'll drive around in a nice car. You'll be able to get the girls you can't get because you're, you know, you're sort of a loser at school, et cetera. So I just started looking at all these things. I saw that the sperm count of boys um, had dropped 50%, that the IQs of boys had dropped 15%. And just, I started, you know, looking and wondering about, you know, the, two things. One is how amaz how, how much evidence there was for the boy crisis. And the second was exactly the question you asked. Since it's so evident and we're so focused on girls and women's issues, why are we not see, even seeing the, the boys and men's issues that are coming up and how damaging it is to women to not have father involvement, for example. Um, women that I had dated be between my marriages uh, were constantly talking about being overwhelmed. Um, and so women are losers by fathers not being involved. Fathers feel a lack of purpose um, and they, they deal with the, the whole thing that you talk about in your first rule of you know not having um, not having some type of change of culture where there's a vitality to give them uh, to give them purpose, and so we're we're in a very uh, challenging situation. I did come to understand what the cause of it is, um, but but it really is uh, depressing to see how um, ubiquitous that cause is. So why do you think if the crisis is 
of the magnitude that you suggest. Um, you 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 cite some statistics in the early part of your book. Um, more men in the UK have died by suicide in the past year than all British soldiers in all wars since 1945. Suicide now takes more lives than war, murder, and natural disasters around the world combined. That might not include COVID, I presume, that statistic. Stealing right. more than 36 million years of healthy life, and the rate of suicide is growing much faster for men than for women. Um, you mentioned that boys' IQ has dropped about 15 points since the 1980s and make a case in your book that that's related to fatherlessness. We'll get back into that. Boys scored lower than girls in the 63 largest developed nations in which the PISA, a set of international standard tests, was given. Boys are 50% more likely than girls to fail to meet basic proficiency in any of the three core subjects of reading, math, and science. By eighth grade in the US, 40% of girls are at least proficient in writing compared to one in five boys. One in five. Boys who perform as well as girls are graded less favorably. You know, we did some research years ago showing that agreeable children get better grades than their IQ would predict. And girls are more agreeable than boys. And so what that means is if you're less agreeable and more likely to be troubled then because that is associated with being less agreeable, then you're graded more harshly than your pure cognitive ability would predict. And that probably accounts for the gender difference, or at least for part of it. Mm. Not that it particularly matters, but um, boys have gone from 61% of university degrees to 39%. Girls, the reverse. Percent of boys who say they don't like school has gone up 70% since 1980. I imagine it was already pretty high in 1980. Boys are expelled from school three times as often and girls, as girls. That's the same statistic, basically, as boys are more likely to be arrested for conduct disorder, juvenile delinquency. Men are much more likely to be imprisoned. Um, it's the same pattern there. One in three children in the UK and the US grow up without a father. Um, and, you know, our culture pushes the idea constantly that all families are of equal virtue, let's say. And I suppose that's justified in that it's self-evident that of all the things that people strive to do well in their lives, they strive to raise their children, I would say, more diligently than, than, than they might meet any other requirement or responsibility. And so it seems cruel to judge the quality of a family given the commitment that it takes, for example, to be a single parent. But I, I'm releasing a podcast this week with Richard Trombley, who's perhaps the world's foremost authority on the development of aggression in children, development and regulation. And he, his data certainly indicates that having a single mother, especially a single mother with issues, um, is uh, uh, a predictor of the maintenance of aggressive behavior throughout the lifespan, a major predictor. Now, he associates that more with uh, trouble on the maternal side, uh, young mothers, young uneducated mothers, young uneducated mother mothers with psychiatric and other health difficulties who lack social support. He hasn't concentrated so much on the fatherlessness end of it, but the upshot is, or the takeaway is the same. These are, these are families that are not producing children who have the same probability of thriving, let's say. Um, you said also Japan has increased its vocational education programs so that 23% of its high school graduates graduate study at vocational schools and they have a 99.6% employment rate. That's something we can talk about as well. So your, your book is peppered with, well, <laughs> Painful statistics, I would say. Um, why do you think we don't attend to this, Warren? I think historically and biologically, um, men were programmed um, and, and, and really through animals, including insects, right on through to human beings, uh, we were programmed to be able to be willing to die in order to get women's love. And so in every generation had its war. 
And in each generation's war, we said some version of Uncle Sam needs you. And we pointed to the uncle who in the Marine uniform on the on the count on the on the mantle. Uh, and we were so proud of him. He died in World War One or two. And the boy sees that the way he can get love and approval and respect, even though he's being criticized by this person or that person or in school or at home, um, is he can he can he can be a soldier. And so we give we inspire boys to be disposable. Um, and we and we and and when, and when somebody is likely to be lost, um, the, uh, you do, you don't develop as much emotional attachment uh, to that person. And if you if your if your way of surviving is for males to be willing to lose their life, so we're not under Nazi rule, etc., you begin to develop a connection between caring about um, men largely to the degree that they are willing to protect women and die for women. And so you don't care about the people who are dying so much if you have a, an incentive in there to, uh, if you have, have an incentive to have them be willing to die in order to protect you. And so- So it's a disposable male hypothesis. That would be the hypothesis on the evolutionary psychology front. I mean, one of the things I've noticed is that my, my critics, let's say, like to parody my audience as, well, angry, white, and young, and male, let's say. Um, but th the thing that's interesting about that is that perhaps you could give me the benefit of the doubt and say that if that is my audience, and my audience is certainly much broader than that, and that wasn't who I was targeting, let's say, but even if it was, well, is there something wrong with talking to those people who are alienated and angry and perhaps for some genuine reason? Um, the answer seems to be, the default answer seems to be they're so contemptible that anyone who even tries to help them is to be regarded with extreme suspicion. And it seems to me that that's in some manner a reflection of the phenomenon that you're discussing, which is a very, uh, what would you say, if it's it's very deeply rooted and fundamental, um, at least from one perspective. So, you know, I was thinking today, maybe our culture set up so that the most esteemed people are highly successful men, but the least esteemed people are unsuccessful men. And so maybe, maybe that, maybe that's the strange paradox is that we, men so in some sense have it the best if they're occupying the pinnacle of achievement but they have it the worst if they're at the bottom of the heap yes, and that, that seems right if you look at women's dating preferences for example compared to men women disproportionately are disproportionately attracted to successful men and disproportionately likely even to rank men of average attainment as below average uh, yeah. whether it's attractiveness or or any of the other uh criteria by which such things might be judged. Yeah. So, you know, the question is, if it is so deeply rooted, well, one question is, if it's so deeply rooted, what makes you think there's anything that we can do about it? I mean, you haven't had any luck, for example, convincing the White House over years to, to pay some attention to boys, essentially, even though they're the problem, let's say. You, you might think that even from the perspective of prevention, there would be some some attention paid in that direction. But this bias is so pervasive that it seems to even interfere with that. Absolutely. So a few things, lots of really good things you brought up. So let me deal with the first thing on the anger issue. Um, one of the, um, I don't know um, if we've discussed this before, uh, Jordan, but I've, I've been teaching couples communication workshops for 30 years and um, just produced a, 30, uh, a Zoom course on that a few, a few days ago. Um, and one of the things that is fundamental to that course is, um, is that men and women, and uh, this is gay couples as well, and trans couples, and, um, and even parents and children all complain about their partners or their parents or their child's anger. And, almost, uh, and one of the things that I work with them on is to understand that anger is vulnerability's mask. And the moment you see your partner as angry, 
look for the vulnerability that created that anger, that felt the fact that they felt rejected or the possibility that they felt rejected, the fe- possibility that they felt misunderstood, the possibility that they said what they feel they bother, that bothers them over and over again, but that it's been ignored. And every time that they say that, uh, say what bothers them, uh, there's a response to it that disconnect, that cuts, cuts them off and interrupts them before they finish their full feeling. They're not drawn out and the response that they um, get is an argument. And so they tend to not bring up issues that really concern them because it's only going to be met by an argument that will escalate the problem. And so they end up walking on eggshells. Now, who does that? Men, women, both sexes do that. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's straight or gay couples. They both do. This is a complaint that I hear from literally everybody. Um, and so when when your audience is, is um, criticized as being angry, I would just ask, you know, if you if you look at that anger as the vulnerability, how is that audience not being heard? And the way you are serving that audience is to hear some, if to the degree that that audience is part of, part of your audience, is 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 serving that audience by healing them, by having them have a place where they feel heard, as opposed to dismissed. When someone feels dismissed, they become uh, depressed, they become, they turn inward. Um, and an example of that is when men and fathers and mothers go through the family court system, uh, fathers are much less likely to feel heard in the family courts mm-hmm. to feel treated as equals. Oh, that's another reason why I wanted to talk to you b- before and today. In my clinical practice, I had men who were fine, upstanding men who were absolutely ground into nothing by the family court system. I mean, I pulled all the tricks I had out of my hat. One client in particular, a medical professional who whose life was completely destroyed by the family law system. It was like watching a train wreck in slow motion, to use a terrible cliche. We tried every trick in the book to keep him afloat. What he wanted was 50% access to his three kids. And he was a really good father. I went out with him a number of times with his kids and watched how he interacted with them and how he taught them and 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 how he cared for them and went to his house and looked at how he set up their bedroom. And I mean, he did, this guy did everything right. He was extremely high in conscientiousness, so unsurprising. But, um, you know, he had his driver's license taken away. He had his passport taken away. He had his livelihood demolished by ill-founded rumors by a spouse that was hell-bent on his destruction. I mean, we even went so far as to have him pick up his kids when, when they made the switch in front of a really, really busy supermarket. She would pull up behind him, right in front of the doors of the supermarket. The kids would come out, she would stay in the car. The kids would come out and go into his truck and pull away so that everything that transpired between the two of them was in full public view all the time. And despite that, she managed to get into his car a number of times. But anyways, he 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 was just demolished. And I've seen this. In, and you know, I get criticized. Maybe Maybe we can go into this a little bit. I get criticized for a couple of things by men um, regularly. One is I get criticized because I stand up for traditional marriage. And there's always a proportion of men who write, and they're usually men who've been demolished by the family court system, who say, look, you should stop telling young men to adopt a permanent relationship, get married, because the family court system is so um, prejudiced against men that to sign a marriage contract, if you sign it with the wrong person, is you know tantamount to a well. Let's not call it a death warrant, but but it's a very bad idea, you know. And my my response to that is, well, you're basically married if you live together for six months, anyways. And so I don't see how the marriage actually adds to that, you know, in terms of in terms of risk. Um, but there, it's not like I don't understand that there's a point there, and. It's, it's interesting because I do believe that the family court system, I've looked at it, I've been involved in it several times, uh, wasn't to my benefit, I would say. Um, the, men have, the men who are objecting have a point. And then I'm also suggesting to young men, another point of criticism, that you know they adopt traditional responsibilities to the degree that that's possible and that that's where they'll find meaning. But you know, some of your work makes me second guess that, at least to some degree, wondering if, I just don't see an alternative, I suppose. That's really the issue, is that, well, what do we have? We have our jobs, we have our careers, we have our loved ones, we have our families. 
that's life. And if you don't have that, well, then you're adrift. That's the purpose void that you talk about in this, in this book. Um, but if the traditional pathways to meaning, let's say, are no longer reliable, what's a guy to do, let's say? We, we really, we really, so to, to affirm what you're saying and put a piece of data to that, um, when people are going through the family court system, mothers and fathers are going through the family court system, uh, the father is eight times as likely as the mother to commit suicide from the frustration, obviously, of not feeling able to connect to his, his children. What, what very few mothers and fathers understand is that, you know, dads have adopted in their traditional role, sort of a father's cash 22. They learn to earn money. To, they they le learn to love their family by being away from the love of their family. Uh, they often do things like they may drive ca cabs. They may, um, they may quit their passion of being an elementary school teacher, becoming a superintendent or a principal of schools. And they, hate, they hate administration, uh, but they end up earning more money because they want their children to do better than they had a chance to do in their life. They want the children to go to a good school, which means a good school district, which means a more expensive home, which means that if they were a musician or an actor or, or a uh, writer or that elementary school teacher, they have to give up that for the most part because they'll earn more doing something that they like less. And so we've- Right, we've, which is something, that, which is part of the pay gap that's never really emphasized is that one of the ways you earn more, and you outlined that in, in I think, a great book, Why Men Earn More. I think that is a great book. Um, you know, you point out that you earn more for doing jobs that are less desirable, intrinsically desirable in some sense. I mean, that's part of the equation, at least. Their jobs are more dangerous. They take you away from home more often, et cetera. And, and those are disproportionately male jobs. I mean, the guy that I saw who got demolished so badly, you know, his wife claimed to be the primary caregiver and the courts are tilted so that they favor the mother, especially in the first three years of a child's life. And I've had some sympathy for that perspective um, for a variety of reasons, although I think I've, I think I've rethought my stance and believe that 50-50 custody default is the appropriate default, um, uh, just like 50-50 default with regards to money earned during the uh, life of the marriage is the default. Um, but my, my client worked a lot uh, to provide for his family and so and his wife stayed at home and was with the kids all the time as a consequence. And because of that, when they went to court, she had the upper hand in the, um, in the, in the custody negotiation because the judge believed perhaps that it was in the best interest of the children that they continue with their primary caregiver. And that's a very hard argument to, to push aside, given the strength of the mother-child bond, especially in the first, especially in the first year. I mean, maybe, maybe the first year is exceptional. Perhaps it's not. Perhaps we have to move to 50-50 regardless. But what do you think about that? Well, I, I, there's four, one of the things that I talk about in the boy crisis is the four must-dos after divorce. And this is like, I'm now putting huge amounts of research together into sort of four simple things. Um, but one, the number one and most important is that the children have an equal amount. By the way, this is if you want the children to do almost as well as they would in an intact family, not as well, but almost as well. Okay, so this is a child sent. See, that's something we should establish here too as a principle. A child. A child my, yeah, my sense is always marriage is for children, not for adults. Exactly. That's, they're the primary. They're the primary target of, of, uh, of rank ordered importance. Children and, first, and that then is, the adults. Marriage is for children, not for adults. That's that's a very immature way of looking at the world. If you think your marriage is for you, you have, you have a free choice when you have children to have the children or not have the children. That's like having a free choice to take the job or not take the job. But once you take the job, you take the responsibilities with it. And um, and so so in court, what I talk about, I do a lot of expert witness work on this issue. And in court, what I ex explain is that we, na we now, for the first time in the last five or six years, we now have really incontrovertible evidence that four things are really needed if we want the children to do the best mm. um, to divorce. 
Number one is an equal amount of time with mother and father. The closer you get to 50-50, even when the child is like one year old or just born, it is, that, is, um, that leads to the greatest possibility of a positive out outcome on so many measures that we'd have to spend almost a half hour talking about those. Well, I'd like, I would like to talk about that to some degree because it's, sure. it's somewhat counterintuitive. So I think it's important to delve into that. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Um, and then two, number two um, is that the father and mother live within about 20 minutes drive time from each other uh, because when they don't, oftentimes mm. they become very resentful of the other parent because they have to go to that other parent's home and miss, miss their soccer practice. So therefore, they don't get the skills and the teamwork and the continuity to be good on the soccer team or miss their best friend's birthday party or whatever. Um, and so um, there's a tension when the father and mother live after divorce, uh, more than about 20 minutes of drive time from each other. Number third, number three is that the children cannot um, experience any bad mouthing or negative body language from mom toward dad, or dad toward mom. Because when the child um, looks in the mirror, and let's say the child's a boy, and um, hears that your father is irresponsible, and your father's a liar, and your father mm -hmm. is this and that, that boy is looking in the mirror and saying, well, maybe I'm a narcissist like my dad. Well, maybe the boys, are, young boys play dad. Exactly. And so whatever they think of as dad is going to be is be is going to enter their space of fantasy. And I mean, what they play out in their fantasy play is their destiny. Yes. And so yes. that, and that image of, of future masculinity, I mean, I always think of Captain Hook when I think of that, because Peter Pan stays Peter Pan because he doesn't want to be Captain Hook. And it's a brilliant, it's brilliant mythologically, that story, because it's got it exactly right. If you conceptualize the great father as power hungry tyrant, which is increasingly the way we conceptualize our entire society and we call it patriarchal, then why would you want to grow up to be that? Why, why do you want to be that adult? And so if the mother is modeling her opinion that that's what constitutes dad, th she's also modeling her opinion that that's what constitutes future mature son, since he's going to be dad. Yes, exactly. And then that boy hearing that both, let's say if he hears that from the mother, by the way, this is true father to mother also. I mean, dad mouthing in the part of the father of the mother is really damaging to the child because not only does the child, is that child half the genes of the other parent, but also the child can't bring it up to either parent because if it brings it up to the parent that made that complaint, um, and it, it, it loses that the, the favoritism of that parent. If it brings it up to the other parent that your dad said this or mom said this about you, that destabilizes the child's um, future even more. Right. So the child has a terrible secret all the time. Uh, betrayal. The child's in a state of betrayal all the time, no matter what. Exactly. And, yeah, and I've and, seen children used as weapons continually in, in yeah. exactly that manner. It's, it's, it's appalling. It's, it's appalling beyond comprehension. And then the, the fourth thing that's very important is that the children, that the parents rather, are in couples communication counseling or relationship counseling, not just when there is an emergency. When there's an emergency, there's everything has to be made as a quick decision. And there's a tendency to see the other parent's worst intent. Whereas long-term counseling allows the, the father and the mother to see to have time to hear the mother or father's best intent about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Well, so at, at the bare minimum, that means that the couple gets together in an administrative sense to sort out the necessary details in the presence of a relatively, uh, what would you say, interest-free, commitment-free, bias-free third party. Exactly. So it's really a management ploy rather, in some sense, rather than a counseling ploy per se, or at least you could parse it out in those two ways. Yeah. Obviously, once you have children with someone, you're married to them permanently in some real sense. And so that has to be taken care of. And a lot of taking care of a marriage, I do make this point to some degree in, in Beyond Order, when I talk about making space for romance, a fair bit of marriage is administrative detail and getting that down, getting that right. I mean, that, that does allow you to see some goodwill on the part of your partner as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And you, you brought up a moment ago to go to the, the, the different development, developmental advantages that happen when father and mother are both involved. And those developmental advantages include 
um, the father involvement. Um, so after marriage or after divorce, <coughs> father involvement, um, lack of father involvement is the single biggest predictor of suicide. Um, it is one of the biggest predictors of a child not graduating from high school, f dropping out of school. Um, it's a very big predictor of a child being, um, having, being aggressive, but not assertive. And last time when we did our last interview together, we talked about the whole um, roughhousing uh, dimension of things. And I'm not gonna go through that again because of the, the fact that people can go to that other interview and see that, but there are about nine differences between dad style parenting and mom style parenting. And a lot of those differences, moms are so good at say spotting a sons and daughters um, you know, gifts like say, sweetie, you, you sing so nicely, or you're going to be a, a great actress or a musician or whatever. Uh, you should try it and do that. And dads are likely to affirm that, but not so, um, not so vociferously at first, um, but are more likely to say some, some version of a, well, you know, if you want to be a gym, you know, if you want to be in the Olympics, um, you've got to practice all the time and we'll, yes, we'll give you the, um, uh, some tutoring or we'll, or we'll go out of our way to take you to gymnastics practice. But if you're not really focused on, if you're focused on responding to tweets and, and um, going to parties and doing other things, you're never going to become an Olympic gymnast. So you have to make a trade-off. And the dad is, the dad is much more likely to um, hold, uh, enforce the boundaries around that trade-off and require the child to, to focus and discipline um, uh, on uh, focus and, um, and have um, a postponed gratification around what they say they want to do and give up support for the child if the child doesn't follow through with that and only has a dream that they're not willing to have the discipline to fulfill okay, that. So that's, okay, so there's a real hypothesis there, um, which I think is worth delving into because one question obviously is, well, why is it not good to be without a father? And is it not the case that someone else, maybe two females, for example, could play the paternal role? And obviously that's true to some degree, if we could specify what the paternal role is. But you make a very specific case, which is quite an interesting one, which is that it's fathers primarily who are responsible for the instantiation of delay of gratification. Now, we should point out that among psychologists who are leery of IQ as the best predictor of success in the long run, the vast majority of those psychologists, whose opinion I do not agree with, by the way, um, is that the thing that predicts better than IQ is the capacity to delay gratification. And that seems to be associated with trait conscientiousness and trait conscientiousness, which is dutifulness and industriousness and orderliness, the ability to make and maintain verbal contracts, Conscientiousness is the best predictor of long-term success outside of general cognitive ability. I would also say that in cultures where families are more likely to be intact, and so we could say Southeast Asian cultures, for example, and point out that children from Southeast Asian cultures do disproportionately better in North America than children of North American parents, the reason for that seems twofold. One is more correlational, perhaps, in that those families are much more likely to be intact and so to have fathers. But the second is, is that the advantage that is accrued to those children seems to be in the domain of conscientious striving. It's work ethic. It's the ability to delay gratification. And so if it is the case that father involvement is a key predictor of the capacity to delay gratification, then that's an absolutely crucial issue. And, and it, we need to know, well, is that true? And we also need to know if it's true, why it's true. And perhaps it has something to do with the relative disagreeability of, of fathers. So women are more prone to negative emotion than men, and they're more empathic and, and, and compassionate and polite than men. Men are more disagreeable. And you disagreeableness is the best predictor, by the way, of criminal behavior from the personality perspective, even though it's not a very good predictor. But if you're really, really disagreeable, that's one of the things that can end, that can land you in jail because you don't take other people into account. You can be callous and cruel and unkind. Um, but just because something has its pathologies in the extreme doesn't mean it's not necessary in moderation. And disagreeable people are 
better at saying no and at setting boundaries and at being cruel to be kind, let's say. Well, sure, you're good at that. You want to do that. But here's what it's going to take. And I'm going to draw boundaries and I'm going to draw lines. And you think that's fathers. And what evidence do you have for that? Oh, my goodness. Oh, just for example, one of the things I'll talk about is um, the um, the difference between boundary setting and boundary enforcement. And, you know, dads and moms will both set boundaries very similarly. They'll both say, you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. And children will test boundaries pretty much exactly the same way. They'll mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. as few peas as possible before they get their Absolutely. ice cream. Absolutely. And they, they balance on that edge and push because they want to find out exactly where that border is. My son, who's relatively disagreeable, man, he pushed boundaries at every opportunity when he was between two and four. It was really something to behold. He was a force of nature in going right up to the line and pushing on it just to see what was going to happen, you know, and uh, and so and you, then, you, and then, go ahead. Yeah, and then, the, but the difference between moms and dads is not these boundary setting or the children's challenge, but rather the, um, the boundary enforcement. The child will be able to say to mom some version of like, uh, you know, I had, I had a tough time in school today. I really mm -hmm. felt down because I was teased by this boy and, and he's the best, most popular boy or the most popular girl in the school. Usually would be the boy that would tease him. And, you know, and so mom is saying to herself, you know, well, what am I going to do here? Um, am I going to be get into a big argument over a few peas when he's depressed? That would be insensitive and stupid. Uh, so I'll tell you what, sweetie, you know, you can have this many more peas and then you can have your ice cream. And then the boy will see, ah, negotiating is, or a girl will see, is, is a negotiating is a possibility here. So I'll From have, a position of weakness. I, yes, I'll, I'll, exactly. I, I will have half that many peas that mom, you know, put, set aside. And then mom is going again, you know, all right, now he at least tried. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, okay, you can have the ice cream now. Whereas dad is much more likely to go, um, I'm sorry, we have a deal here, sweetie. I know you had a bad day in school, uh, but you uh, but you need to finish the peas, the deal is, before you get your ice cream. Oh, daddy, you're so mean. Mommy doesn't do that to me. She mm -hmm. went mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and dad goes, well, you know, you can, you can, can, can you continue to complain, but this is my rules now. And if you continue to complain, there'll be no more ice cream. There'll be no ice cream even. It's a possibility tomorrow night. Now we're forcing, the child is getting forced to have to pay attention to doing what she or he needs to do, finish the peas before she or he gets the ice cream, what they want to have. Okay, and so let me take what you said apart a little bit from a personality perspective, okay? So I'm going to hit it from three perspectives. So the first is, I've always been entranced by the Disney movie Pinocchio, and Pinocchio is about the development of an autonomous individual, right? Someone who's free from having his strings pulled by others and who isn't a wooden head, but someone who's alive and can think for himself. And as Pinocchio develops, he faces a number of temptations. And one is to become an actor, which means to become a deceiver or a player of parts rather than the real thing. But another is to become a neurotic wreck who wants vacations. So he's tempted by Pleasure Island. And the way the fox and the cat tempt him is by convincing him that he's ill convincing him to capitalize on that and convincing him that the respite for his illness is a vacation from his a permanent vacation from his responsibility so his the temptations are deceitful actor and neurotic victim so it's a very perspicacious film it's a remarkable film but in any case now let's take that apart a little bit so i'll first make an observation from my own marriage my wife is no pushover and she's relatively low in agreeableness by female standards but what I observed in our relationship was that it was hard for her to discipline the children, especially when they were very young. And I think the reason for that was partly temperament, because I think the feminine temperament tilts towards compassion and nurturance, whereas the masculine temperament tilts more towards... Um, uh, Tough love. Yeah, yeah, fine. That's good. Thank you for, for filling in there. Yeah, yeah, it's conditional. It's, it, there's a conditional element to it, not and then judgmental not, element. Not which conditional is, love, by the way, but conditional approval as part of total love. Right, good, good clarification. Absolutely, right, because the container is love. Yes. But, yes. but th that can mean delay of gratification, right? And, and there's a cruelty in delay of gratification, even when you impose it on yourself. It, it's, a, it's a cruelty in the local sense because it causes distress. I mean, right now, my 
son and daughter are teaching their son, who's only uh, slightly over one, no. And I told them to, how to do it. So, for example, he sits at our table out in the backyard and he reaches behind and he's tearing the plants out of the green wall that's behind him. And so that's a no. And I said, I, I encouraged them. I said, look, take his hand, hold it firmly so that he can't move it. Say no. Hold him until he stops struggling to, to undertake his goal-directed activity. He'll probably cry. As soon as he stops resisting, let go and give him a pat. So you do that 20 times. Then when you say no, he'll cry and stop. And then 20 times after that, he'll just stop. He won't cry. So 40 times and you've taught him no, which is an amazing thing because then you can let him go free because whenever you say no, he'll just stop. And so you can facilitate his freedom instead of having to be a helicopter tyrant parent who I've seen many of who is one step behind their ambulatory two and a half year old you know, interfering with absolutely everything he does because he can't grasp a basic principle of socialization. In any case, no has some pain associated with it because otherwise it wouldn't produce tears. And no is a very, very hard thing to learn. And no is what the world teaches, not just what people teach. In any case, back to my wife. She spent the first year bonding with the child and also learning how to respond essentially, especially in the first six months, to his or her every whim. Because a crying infant demands instant recourse. And a crying infant is always right, especially if they're under six months of age. But then when the kid becomes ambulatory and starts to require discipline, the woman is required to switch from this primarily em empathic role, which is facilitated by hormonal transformation post pregnancy, by the way, from this primarily nurturing role to a role that is in some ways in the local environment, it's antithesis. It's very hard for women to do that. And so my observation has been that they, they need, they require someone else to bolster that element because it runs at counter purposes to what they're required to do in early infancy. And so, okay, so, so delay of gratification, we're going to focus on that. And an example illustrating what you're saying, and this is hard data-based um, example that I talk about in the boy crisis, is the um, is is bedtime. So what we know uh, when we look at bedtimes set by mothers and fathers is that moms will set bedtimes earlier than dads will. Um, dads will set bedtimes later, but the children end up, when studied, going to bed earlier when they're with the dad than they do with the mom. And so why is that? What the dad will be more likely to do is say some version of like, uh, okay, bedtime is nine o'clock. And um, if and whatever, it, when you get all your chores done, when you get yourself, your, you brush your teeth, you change your clothes, you've done your homework, et cetera. Um, and I see your homework and it's done well. Uh, then any time that you have between when you're finished, when, when your sister and brother are both finished, uh, your homework, et cetera, that time you have to play or do, or, or ask me to do whatever I want, read your favorite story, et cetera. Uh, with mom, she's more likely to, and so the kids end up rushing to get through the, everything that they need to do uh, that is postponed gratification in order to get what they want to have, their, their story read to them, some roughhousing before bedtime, um, and you know something along those lines, um, and then with the understanding that they will then, uh, everything will be cut off at, at, um, at nine o'clock. The children with mom are more likely to, um, uh, mom is, is, well, is, says, you know, bedtime is this time, it's 9.30, let's say, and the children, it gets to be 9.30, and one of the boys or kids will say, you know, well, I haven't done my homework, you know, knowing that mom will want the child to have done his or her homework um, be, with, um, uh, rather than um, go to bed without having homework be done. And so the, uh, so mom will say, well, all right, you should have done your homework before, but uh, we'll allow you a little bit more time for, for finish your homework off. And so the boy is able to, or, or girl, is able to manipulate better, more time than, than that 9.30. 30 time um, and stay open even or uh, stay um, up up even later. Uh, what, what the dad makes clear to the child is that if um, if if he or she does not, if they use up all that time and they haven't done up that done the homework and it's now nine o'clock your bedtime, 
um, sorry, but you are, um, you, you will not, you'll just go to school and not have your homework done. That's your responsibility to get that done by, by this uh, point in time. And so, the, the, um, and so that's one of the sort of dynamics that happens that lead to children being more likely to be focused on doing what they need to do. And, um, and also children brought up by mothers are more likely to be ADHD. If they're brought up predominantly by mothers, 30% of children are ADHD. That includes the average between boys and girls. Boys are obviously more likely to be ADHD. Uh, whereas with fathers brought up predominantly by fathers, only 15% are likely to have ADHD. Because you can see from those examples that the, the boy or the girl, the children, are required to focus on doing what they need to do, get that homework done, get their teeth brushed uh, before they get what they want to have. Um, and the same, we talked last time about roughhousing, how uh, the, chil the children were, um, were prevented from having more roughhousing fun if they pushed their sister or their brother out of the way and they didn't consider their the, the, the needs of their brother and sister. So back, back, back to the, the personality differences. So women are higher in negative emotion and they're higher in trait agreeableness. And so the way to manipulate someone who's high in negative emotion is to manifest negative emotion and to say, um, here's a bunch of reasons why I'm not doing so well. And so I deserve a break. And that, that, so because of the sensitivity to negative emotion, the fact of the negative emotion is more compelling because it's more deeply felt. And then the agreeableness means that there's a much higher probability of being felt sorry for. And, and you can see that in the positive light when you're dealing with infants, because when they're in distress, the proper response is immediate gratification of their desires. But that's not a good long-term strategy, which is, I think, likely why, well, I don't exactly understand the relationship with lower agreeableness. It's certainly the reason for the emergence of conscientiousness, which is a cold virtue and which involves delay of gratification. Now, men are not more conscientious than women. They're more industrious and industrious to some slight degree and less orderly. And those two combined make conscientiousness. But the agreeableness difference is definitely, you know, it's, it's quite pronounced. And so, you know, partly what you're arguing for from the perspective of a personality psychologist is the necessity for two parent families really on temperamental grounds on, and really on biological grounds. I mean, these things are mutable to some degree, but not easily. Not, and, and the other thing that's quite interesting is that and this is something everyone should really listen to, is that they're anti-mutable given the way that our society is proceeding. So you might say, well, there are these personality differences between men and women, higher neuroticism in women, so that's proclivity to negative emotion, and higher agreeableness. But if we made our societies equal, those personality differences would go away and then we wouldn't require bi-gendered um, parenting. But what's happened is that if you go to the Scandinavian countries where the attempts to equalize the social landscape have gone the furthest and in some sense had the most success, um, there are notable exceptions. So. If you rank order countries by the egalitarian nature of their social policies, now and that doesn't require that any of them have perfectly egalitarian policies, it just requires that you admit that some cultures are more egalitarian than others in their attempts and their practices. And I think only a fool wouldn't put the Scandinavian countries at the top of that list. Then you'd say, well, what that should mean is that in Scandinavia, the personality differences between men and women are minimized, and in authoritarian countries, they're maximized. And exactly the reverse is what happens, is if you iron out the wrinkles in the social landscape so that it's more egalitarian, men and women get more different with regards to their interests, people versus things. So women get more interested in people and less interested in things and less interested in the STEM fields, at least in partial consequence, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And they get even more different than men in terms of their neuroticism and their agreeableness, not less. And so that argues against easy social amelioration of this 
necessity for by gender two parent households. Yes. Yes, the, the, the children that seem to do the best are ones that have, they're in intact families, or as I mentioned before, uh, the children have about an equal amount of time with both parents, and that there is a checks and balance parenting. So uh, a child will come to the, father, the mother and say, can I climb the tree in the backyard? And mom will say, well, maybe in a few years, sweetie, but not right now. Um, you're too young and you could really hurt yourself. And that, the child will ask the same thing of a dad and the dad will be more likely to say, well, yes, I guess so, but be careful. And then the, if the mother finds out, the child, the father and the mother will go, well, wait a minute, you know, you're not you know, blah, blah, blah. The you're playing one against the other here, kid. Uh -huh. Good yes. work, but no. Yes, but the, well, the kid will play one against the other, but, but, but one of the best responses to that is for the child to be able to see the mother and father negotiating. Right, right, right absolutely. And saying, you know, well, yes, you can climb the tree, but you can't go this beyond this branch this high, and you can't, you know, go on these branches. And dad, you uh, you need to be out there under the tree so that in case the child falls, uh, the, you know, the child will... will um, be cushioned by your fall and, and don't get preoccupied with the cell phone. In fact, maybe give me the cell phone while you're out there with uh, with Ginger or Mary under the tree. And right, so, so they see the negotiation between masculine and feminine taking place. Why do you think that's so important? And, and you say there's research supporting that specific proposition. It's a very specific proposition. So what's the research? And well, it's both specific and metaphorical. Specifically, um, we now know that children climbing trees um, um, makes them worry about what risks are worth taking, what risks aren't, that fires um, synapses that are outside of their normal synapse firing uh, um, development. And, there are, and the data that we have for that is that the is that the IQs of children doing risk-taking behaviors like climbing trees increase as they do that risk-taking behavior and they increase their psychomotor functioning. We see okay, so there's this, prop, there's this concept uh, that uh, Russian developmental psychologist came up with, Vygotsky, called the zone of proximal development. And one of the things he noted was that, um, I believe it was Vygotsky who discovered this, it might not have been, but it's the same phenomenon, so it doesn't really matter. So if you analyze the way that parents talk to children who are developing their language, so infants who are still learning to speak, the adults don't speak to the infant in terms that the infant can understand precisely. The adults speak to the infant slightly ahead of its developmental trajectory. And Vygotsky called that the zone of proximal development, which is the key zone to be in if you're going to learn. So imagine, and I make much of this in my books, that there's a domain that you've already mastered. And so that when you operate in that domain, the things you want to happen, happen. That's the domain of order. And then there's another domain where all hell breaks loose and you don't know what to do. And that's the domain of chaos. But there's an intermediary where you're expanding your zone of competence through exploration. And that's really where consciousness operates. And that's, that's where we learn. And so risk-taking behavior isn't exactly risk-taking behavior. It's, it's embeddedness in the zone of proximal development. I'll give you an example. So it's germane to your example. So when my kids were little, I bought this old wrecked um, wooden play set uh, monkey bars and and swings. It was dilapidated, but I took it home and sanded it down and repainted it, and you know gave it about five or six more years of life. And uh, my daughter, who was about two and a half at the time, would go out there on that monkey bar, and so it was a ladder going up about six feet, which was a pretty decent ladder for for a little two and a half year old, you know. And so we were inclined to watch her. And she would stand on the first rung and then move her foot a quarter of the way up towards it and then half a way up towards it and then three quarters of the way up towards it. And then she'd put her foot on the rung and then she'd do the same with her next foot, staying in that zone of proximal development. Can I move a quarter of a step? Can I move half a step? Can I move three quarters of a step? And we'd watch her do that. And doing that, she pinned all those movements together and mastered climbing up the monkey bar. And it was much to our satisfaction to watch her because she was taking, she wasn't taking a risk exactly. She was pushing herself out into the zone of proximal development and, and engaging in this mastery behavior. So you could say in some sense, and I believe this to be the case, that the masculine spirit encourages and facilitates the transformation. So if the, if the feminine is 
is concentrating on who the child is now and what that child now needs. The masculine is concentrating on how that child can move to the next developmental stage and yeah. pushing that along. Is that, is that a reasonable presumption? A, yes, and B, here's an example of that also that, that coordinates um, or connects perfectly with that. Uh, the data shows that dads are more likely, for example, uh, to use words that the child does not yet understand or does not understand at that time. And, um, and the mom is oftentimes looking at it and saying, well, you know, why are you saying that? You know, uh, the child doesn't understand what you mean. And the dad's conscious or unconscious sort of feeling is, I want to plant seeds. And after the child hears this in different contexts, um, she or he will begin to sort of understand what that word is and what that means. And moms feel it's just moms are more likely to feel uh, that's just so insensitive. Okay. You're so using the word. being in this zone of proximal development, like if I brought that into the conversation because you talked about risk taking. And so what you could say is that as you push the boundaries of the zone of proximal development, you enter the domain of risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then the question would be what personality elements are capable of tolerating the transformation of the zone of proximal development into the zone of risk. And the answer to that would be lower neuroticism and lower agreeableness because lower neuroticism would mean you wouldn't worry as much. So the, the magnitude of the perceived risk would be less and lower agreeableness would mean, well, even if there is some risk, you don't care as much. It's like, it's okay. Now it's not like you don't care about the risk exactly, although it's, it is that in some felt sense, but the reason for that is that, well, there's another judgment, which is, well, the risk is worth taking because there's more than one risk at play here. There's the proximal risk, that you engage in when you push yourself, but there's the distal risk that you engage in when you don't push yourself. You're, yes, you're right on target there now. And this is why so many of the differences between male and female style parenting are so important to, to understand. And what, one of those that sort of connects to what you're saying is that the differences that moms and dads tend to, to get into about dads teasing children. Um, and which feels to many moms like it often results in the child crying uh, when the teasing first starts, um, but it begins to teach the child a whole series of skill sets. Um, you know, uh, what's, what tones of voice are teasing or playfulness? And it's like roughhousing, it has mm -hmm. a lot to do with play. Teasing is an abstraction of roughhousing. Exactly, uh, precisely. Um, you know, what eye, what eye contact is pl being playful, what eye contact is serious, uh, what, body, what body language, what I'm exaggerating now. Um, you get off the bed because if you don't get off the bed, daddy will always be make it make life hard for you. You know how bad daddy is. Um, and, the, you know, the child starts laughing. Maybe after a while, maybe one time this going like that. The, the child goes, oh, my goodness, is scared. And so then after a while, the child learns that, oh, that's daddy having fun. That's us having fun. And they begin to distinguish between um, make sure you get off the bed as fun versus make sure you get off the bed as, you know, something that is. Right. Well, they also learn to distinguish between what's mean and what's funny. You know, I, I mean, when I was watching my children, especially with regards to their sibling rivalry, which is likely to emerge in children who are less than three years apart in their birth order and, and sort of in proportion to the closeness of their, of their birth. Um, so if you want to minimize childhood sibling rivalry, you space the children out three years. We don't know what that does to their relationship across time, but we know it minimizes sibling rivalry. In any case, I wanted them always to stay on the funny side of teasing because teasing can easily turn into torture. And so they had to learn these extremely fine gradations of humor. And, and, and to do that, they had to play on the edge. And the question is, how necessary is it to have the capacity to allow your children to play on the edge? And fathers have that by temperament more than mothers do. Now, but you, you, know, you pointed out something really interesting. You didn't exactly make the claim that the father was necessary. You made a more subtle claim, which was that the dialogue between the father's higher risk tolerance and the mother's lower risk tolerance is necessary. And that takes place, that can take place within an intact marriage. But you also said it can take place in, an, in a marriage that's been broken apart as long as the couples commit to a long-term communication strategy, that a long-term supervised communication strategy. 
Yes, yes. So it's the dialogue maybe that's really the issue here. It's the interplay between masculine and feminine. Is that the key thing rather than the presence of both? Is Because you can imagine a man and a woman in a household who don't communicate ever about anything. And I can't imagine that that's going to be an optimal environment for a child, despite the fact that both parents are nominally there. Yes, yes, absolutely. The, the, the children do well when both parents are involved a, a, about equally. And that's because of a lot of subtle things here. One, for example, is hangout time. And particularly boys, if you ask them, like, how is soccer today? Uh, the boy will say, okay. And, um, but with hangout time and, and no, not much more. Well, what else happened? What happened at soccer today? Nothing much. Um, you know, and then, but if the father has hangout time, let's say in a divorce situation with the child, uh, the child is likely maybe their um, one's doing homework, the other was doing their a different type of work, and they end up in the kitchen together and they're looking through the thing, and then the boy will say, "You know, dad, you know, daddy, I, I don't get it. If you if you're playing soccer and you're doing really well, and I was goalie last week." And this week I wasn't goalie, but I thought I did really well. And the, and the, and the coach even said I did really well. But now he put, he put in Jimmy for goalie, goalie instead of me. Uh, what's that about? Um, and that's when children with hangout, uh, with hangout time, both boys and girls tend to, to do much better than they do when they just are asked a quick question for a conversation. For daughters, hangout- They need time for the questions to bubble up, to um, bubble up of, of their own accord. Exactly, or some little thing reminds them of something. You know, if you ask a child, how are you doing? Oftentimes they'll say fine. But if you say, you know, if you ask them something specific, how did you like having the ice cream taken away from you by, by somebody at school? Then they'll have a response to that. Um, so when something triggers something that is very specific, the child will tend to sort of open up and um, on his or her own terms. And interestingly, I said hangout time was very important for boys. Uh, psychologically, the, uh, some researchers at the University of California, Irvine, said it's the single greatest predictor of psychological security in girls' hangout time with dads. And hangout time with moms and dads has a different dimension to it. The children know that if they if they say say a problem to mom, she's more likely to be reassuring. I'm sure that you know I'm sure mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. really wanted, wanted you to do really well. He was probably just giving the other the other the other um, a per person a chance because uh, in order for them to feel good about themselves, like you did when you played goalie. Whereas the child is usually likely to know that the dad is more likely to say, well, you know, what did you do? Uh, that maybe was not um, so good as a goalie. Uh, what do you think you can do that's different with the, with, the, uh, with the coach next time? Did you ask the coach directly why she or he took you away from being a goalie? And so um, the children- That's more of a problem-solving approach. Or a problem And you think that's associated with the positive developmental consequence for IQ? I think it is. I, but, you know, it's and, not that lower IQ fathers tend to get divorced more often by any chance, is it? Uh, we, we, well, we do know that that mothers are who are well educated are far more likely. To, about ninety percent of divorces um, come from mothers are initiated um, by the plaintiff is the mother, um, and um, when the mother is well educated, she has other sources of income, other sources of education, and um, and, and security. And she also knows, um, obviously, that in the family courts, um, she's far more likely to have the children. And the father is far less likely, you know, she's more likely to have the right to the children. He's more likely to have to fight for the children. Um, and, um, and so that, there's all sorts of dynamics going on there. But I, th I think the most important thing here to understand is that, like we were talking a bit before about teasing, there are so many um, developmental um, advantages to a lot of the things that dads do. But I want to really make it clear that dads don't say to moms things like, I'd like to roughhouse with the children because it will increase the children's empathy. I'd like to roughhouse with the children because it will increase their social skills. I'd like to tease with the children because it will increase their social abilities to, to have to- play. Right, God, who could stand to be married to someone who did that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the result of that is that, you know, moms can't hear what dads don't say. And one of the, so one of the reasons why the communication about what is, and, and dads need to take responsibility for reading about uh, what there is 
uh, that we do that's differently and what the outcomes are um, of, of the things that we do differently. So I've never heard of a father say to a mother, you know, the teasing that I do um, with, with, with our daughter or our son, you know, when we go into, when kids go into the workplace and they haven't learned how to be, uh, they haven't learned teasing, uh, they feel that teasing is sort of an insult. Uh, or, uh, uh, and right, so, they're touchy, they're touchy. Very, very and touchy. they can't take a joke with a sense of humor. Exactly. Yeah, we had very explicit discussions about such things in my household. So, I mean, I wanted the kids to be inoculated against casual insult. You, you have to take that with a sense of humor or, or it just mounts. I've seen people who can't respond to that initial testing, you know, and it's partly what people do to see if you're socialized, you see. Because people want to socialize with people who are about as socialized as them. And so what they'll do first is throw out some teasing and see what happens. And if it evokes a playful response, then they know that the person that they're dealing with can be relied on to play and has been reasonably socialized. You're, you're hitting the nail right on the head. Uh, um, the commerce of masculinity is the, the trading of wit covered put downs. And men learn as they grow up that, and I think probably the reason that that happens is because um, men learn that if you can handle if you can handle criticism, you're not going to be successful. And if you if you're not going to be successful, you're also unpredictable because it means that if something small and upsetting comes along, you're going to get big and upset, and that isn't what you want. You don't want someone who's going to get upset about something small. It's it's too dangerous in a crisis. Absolutely, and so for, from a male point of view, from most men's point of view, um, the feeling is if you can't be teased. You can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. can't right, be teased, right, exactly. You can't be really respected. And here's the type of problems that that creates in the workplace. So if you're if you're a dad talking to your to the mom about teasing children, help her see how this evolves into the workplace. So in the workplace, um, a, a girl, a woman, oftentimes may get teased, and she will interpret that teasing like you know, um, did, did you I see you, see you have a new dress on? Are you uh, did you get that to flirt with the boss? Or do you have, you know, you're dressed, um, you must have dressed in the dark last night, um, something like that. That's something if you say, say it to a guy, they come back with, at you with some funny um, counter uh, point like, you know, well, that would be typical for a short man to say, uh, a version of that. And, 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 the, and the men with each other, uh, when they can tease each other like that and play with each other, that means that they're beginning to trust that man and move them into their into their league of people they can respect and trust. Whereas if the woman hears something like that comment, she might feel it's a, it's a sense, it means that she's being discriminated against in the workplace. So she takes that perspective and says- Now, that would be a pr particularly true, I suspect, if she didn't have a lot of masculine presence in her life. Exactly, and she- You know that girls who don't have brothers are much more likely to be raped. I I didn't know that. That's interesting, and I do believe that. Um, and because a, a lot of the and this, this does confirm a number of things that I've heard of, of people who are experts in that area, and that's very very deeply sad. And particularly, what's what's reinforcing this? You were talking about how things in today's culture sort of reinforce this. So let's say this girl, this woman is new to work, and there she's being tested out by being teased. And she feels really insulted and, and she interprets the teasing as discrimination against her, as opposed to interpreting the te teasing as, a as an attempt to include her, uh, to include her. Yeah, so, exactly. Precisely. So she goes to HR. It's an invitation to play. It, it's an invitation to play. It's an mm -hmm. invitation to be If trusted. you're skilled at it, right? I mean, that's, I mean, a tease can go too far and then it's insulting, but, precisely. but, the, but the really good tease is right on the edge, right? And then that's also... It's also a compliment to the person who's designed to receive it because you're facing them with the proposition that they can tolerate a comment. They're sophisticated enough to know when a comment is right on the edge and they're resilient enough to tolerate it and respond in kind. So it's, an, it's a compliment of the highest order to push like that. It is so important that you said that, and that's exactly right. That's exactly what teasing does test for. And that's exactly what men who tease each other are testing for to see if the, if the playfulness can be met with playfulness, it can be met with even a, a greater challenge that requires them to participate in the process. But institutionally today, we've taken- And you think part of that's crucial to IQ development? I, I do think- That's that interesting, because I mean, 
te that teasing banter is a form of, 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 of what dynamic wit. It's like a dance. I mean, some cultures have really perfected that. You get, there's subcultures in England, particularly, where that's elevated to an art form. And, and you see that in places like Newfoundland and Canada as well, and, and in Alberta as well, I would say, in the rural areas in particular. Yes, absolutely. And so now what we've done is institutionalized this teasing as a problem. So the woman upset that she's being discriminated against goes to HR and says, I was discriminated against mm -hmm. what he said to me. Right, thus failing a test in, in a more profound way because one of the things you do when you're in elementary school and junior high school and high school for that matter, and then in the workplace is tease someone and see if they run off to find a figure of authority or whether they can deal with it themselves. Exactly. Because you assume that if they have to run off and find a figure of authority, that they're not mature enough to solve their own problems. That's exactly right. And so what we, so the woman reports it to HR and HR really is no longer HR, really should be called HER uh, because it focuses almost always a complaint by the woman about usually a man and the- uh, Do you know what the stats are in proportion of workplace complaints that are brought forth by women compared to men? I know the OCR st uh, stats of the Office of Civil Rights stats about uh, complaining is about, I think it was, there's a fellow named Joseph Eck who's done the research on that. And I think he said it was like 19 to one, 19 complaints by women about men for each one complaint uh, by men about a, a woman. Right. And that's funny because, you know, the men probably generate the grounds for complaints more often being more disagreeable. And the women are more sensitive to the uh, negative consequences being less emotionally stable, more, more neurotic. So it's that's a place where men and women don't feed back so well to one another, you know, and, and it's unfortunate, but that, that, well, I have wondered, you know, if men and women can inhabit the same workplace over time. We don't know that. I mean, I've been called reprehensible for even bringing that up as an issue, but it's not like we know. We haven't, the data aren't in. We've only been working together in some sense for 50 years, and there's plenty of evidence for sex segregation. It seems to be the, the norm rather than the exception that, you know, once a gender, a sex starts to dominate a field that that dominance becomes more and more predominant until it becomes almost total. You see that with engineering, you see it with nursing. Those are extreme cases, but it certainly does happen. Well, they're not as extreme as bricklaying, which is like all men, but women have, you know, women haven't moved into the bricklaying domain. So we don't know what would happen if they did. They won't, but so we won't know, but you know. No, and this, the, the, the challenge here is is really enormous because the um, in the sexual area, um, it's very rare that a woman is interested in dating somebody at work who is earning less uh, than she is, um, and um, is not doesn't have as high status. And usually, the great majority of women that I've seen that have uh, that were single when they entered the workplace and then married somebody, a significant percentage of them have married somebody in the workplace, but the great majority of that significant percentage have married somebody at least at their level and usually above them at work. Yeah, it's hypergamy, right? And it characterizes women with regard to um, potential for generous earning, essentially. Yeah. And unsurprisingly, I think it's an attempt to balance the economic scales because women take the brunt of pregnancy and, and uh, the brunt of the first year of, of child rearing, I would say as well. So, and they make themselves vulnerable as a consequence. So they need to redress that inequality and that's how they do it. And, but there are consequences to that that are very severe in the socioeconomic and the social spheres. Absolutely. And then when the woman, when a man above her um, does take um, interest in her and, and it's explicit about it, um, you know, it, it, it can either result in courtship or a law court. And so mm -hmm. like, uh, courtship of one form or the other. Yes. Or, and a law, a law, yes. One, a courtship of one, one form or the other. And so it's a really, uh, it's, it's, and, and what the biggest problem of, with that's happened in the last um, 15, 20 years, especially since hashtag me too, um, is that um, I have not yet spoken to a single um, corporate CEO um, who uh, has not said some version of the following to me. You know, Warren, I used to love mentoring women, um, but I have a wife and I have children. There's no way, shape or form that I will mentor a woman today. Um, right. Th uh, there's the you other know, Right, well, it was increasingly insisted upon in, in my workplace at, at the university that if I ever had a female in the room with me, that the door be open. I mean, and as soon as that's the rule, you're, 
you're done. You have to start rethinking everything. Can you travel with your graduate students? Can you be in the same hotel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As soon as you have to start thinking about those things, that means the risk has become so great that you're much less likely to engage in such activity. And mentoring is a very intimate relationship. So it's, it's. It is, and it's oftentimes does, I mean, many men, are particularly inspired to mentor to a woman who's younger that, that is attractive. And many younger attractive women are uh, increase their, um, their caring about and their love for a man who is, who is, who they see as a result of his mentoring. All his yeah, well, you know, across cultures, women prefer men who are about four years older. There's some variation. And that actually is one of the things that is moderated in the Scandinavian culture. So that age gap is less rather than more in the Scandinavian cultures. But that goes along with the genuine general tendency to, to hypergamy, which is preference for a mate who's at or above you in the social hierarchy, yes. uh, or the socioeconomic hierarchy. It's really the social hierarchy, though. Which creates enormous problems in different cultures, like in China, uh, when we do analyses of the dating, the most popular dating site in China, <coughs> you see that... Um, women want a, a, a very high percentage of women. I think it's in the 92 to 93% tile approximately of women uh, want men who own homes and own cars. Um, but of the people on the dating sites who are males, only a very small percentage of them own homes and cars. Right, and well, and we should also point out that women aren't actually going for the home or the car. They're going for the ability to produce the home and the car. Of course, yes. Right, absolutely. they're using them as secondary markers for competent for competence essentially but and then they you know you cite an interesting stat here too which which i thought was worth talking about um day on on who should pay the bill on the first date um 72 percent of women think that a man should pay the full bill on the first date now remember they've already selected this man and what that means is that he's likely to be at or above them in the socioeconomic hierarchy and perhaps slightly older so you know in some sense they can afford he can afford to pay better than she can but in any case 82 percent of men think the same and so men are playing the hypergamy game even more uh, intensely than women are at least with regards to that particular statistic so and this gets into the psychology of the pay gap because many women feel okay about that because they feel like, okay, men earn more than I do for the same work. Um, when, when we, when, and in fact, that is not really accurate. Here is what is accurate. Fa uh, fathers earn more than moms do. The pay gap is not men, mm -hmm. women. The pay gap is um, dads versus moms. And when dads become dads, uh, they're far more likely to give up the things that they love to do that pay less um, and do the things that they like to do a lot less, um, you know, quit that musician gig that paid much less and do something responsible, quote unquote, like selling product Y. Um, yeah, and they, that's also in line with the data that show that, you know, most, m most young men, many, many young men abuse alcohol. Most of them stop when around 27, but that's also when they get married. And so they, they stop engaging in primary gratification. And that's another example of that delay of gratification, as far as I'm concerned, that ability or willingness to sacrifice. Yes, and it's also part of your, your, whole, your whole rule about the, you know, it's important to have stable structures, but it's also important to have flexibility in structures and part of- You know, it, it's so funny that we, it's so rare that we can have a real conversation about this because Let's say that the pay gap, well, you know, it's certainly not obvious what degree the pay gap is caused by female hypergamy, right? If men demanded of their dating partners that they earned more than they do, my guess is that there'd be a pay gap in favor of women because men are incentivized to earn more because if they don't, the, the consequences on the, in the sexual market, but it's not the sexual, it's the um, intimate interpersonal market, right? To not be cynical about it because it's it's not all short-term mating that people are motivated by, For quite the contrary. Well, they're motivated to take the dangerous, more dangerous, less desirable, farther away from, from home and family and interest for that matter, jobs, because the payoff is disproportionately large for men who do so. 
And you see that, you know, you see, and it's exaggerated at the upper end of the distribution as well, which is what you pointed out with regards to the dating sites. You know, like 70% of men are rated as below the 50th percentile in attractiveness by women. And so not only are there rewards for earning more, there are disproportionate awards for men for earning more. And that goes along with the proposition that we put forward at the beginning of this conversation. I think that was recorded as well, that, you know, the most admired people are men, but the least admired people are men as well. And there's a lot more least admired men than there are most admired men. And that's true in, in brutal force on the dating scene, on the websites. Absolutely. And, 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 and as I said, part of the reason that this is sort of all justified is because you know, after all, men have privilege, and you know, and men are you know are the, and the and the pay gap is really a, a reflection of the fact that you know men um, do less work and earn the same. Or um, and, and yes, which is complete bloody nonsense. That's just not true. That stat there is a gap, but the the reason for the gap is very very complex and involves many factors, including the ones we discussed here, which you take apart so nicely in your book. Why men earn more. I think you have 13 reasons that men earn more, you know, that's quite a few reasons. And privilege isn't one of them. <laughs> it's actually 25 differences between the choices that men tend to make and the choices that women tend to make. Um, 25. The, each of the 25 differences are things that do lead to men earning more money. Um, but Could the, you list a few of those now? Because it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting topic. Men are more likely to take hazardous jobs. They're more likely to take jobs like logging or trucking. Uh, they're more likely to take jobs that um, that require them to work weekends or evenings. Um, they're more likely to take jobs that um, that have very little people contact, uh, like being an engineer. And but most men do like people contact. Um, but many of the jobs with uh, less people contact, like being an engineer or mathematician, uh, tend to pay, uh, pay less. Um, the uh, men are more likely to um, let's see, uh, a work, a longer, a longer hours. Oh, so, yeah. um, so the U S Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, when you, when you hear somebody works full time, that only means that they work 35 hours a week or more, not 40 hours a week was what you usually think of as full time. Well, the average person, um, who works 44 hours per week makes twice the money as somebody who works 35 hours a week. It's twice, I see. Well, I remember one of your stats, which was I think 10% more working hours is 20% more income, yes. something like that. But that's a much more dramatic stat statistic. 44 hours is twice as valuable as 35 hours. Yes, on it, on it. And men are much more likely to work that 44 hours or more per week. Right, and thus not be there for their children as is exposed in family court. Exactly, and th and that of course, is, is very fascinating. It's what I call the father's catch-22, that da dads learn to love the family by having to be away from the love of their family. But when the Pew Research Center asked dads who were full-time working dads, uh, would you prefer to remain full-time working? Or if you had the option of leaving your jo job full-time and being full-time with the children, which would you um, prefer? 49% of dads said who worked full time, so these are not sort of loser dads or dads not inclined to work. 49% of dads who work full time said that they would prefer to be home with their children full time uh, and maybe work a little bit or not outside of, of the home. And, um, and yet that, uh, that question has never, it almost never even asked of dads, usually when middle and upper middle class people are married and they have children, uh, the mom generates three options. Option one is to work full time. Option two is to be full time with the children. Option three is to do some combination of both. And dads, you know, they have three options too. Option one is to work full time. Option two is to work full time. And option three is to work full time. Or more accurately, um, if they're a working class person to uh, work two jobs, if they're um, more of a white collar worker, um, they'll tend to sort of uh, work more hours at the job that they're doing. And so that type of, uh, these types of differences are not seen. And, and the easiest way to see these is that um, women who have never been married and never had children, they earn 117% of what men who have never been married and never had children earn. It's only when men 
have get married and have children that they begin to do what you were talking about before and start taking on uh, a, a commitment, a new responsibility. Okay, so your claim, your claim, it's no wonder you're so popular. Your claim is essentially that men don't earn more because of privilege, they earn more because they take responsibility. Not, not that women don't, I'm not saying that, but I'm not saying that they're taking responsibility in a different way because they're focused on the children and maybe they sacrifice their career for that and maybe that's what they want to do but it doesn't matter they're still doing it but the reason that men earn more is because they're earning more for the people they love even yes even politically um liberal people who normally believe in minimal sex roles uh when it when it comes to the children being born uh the mothers are much more likely to sort of even if they're working full-time remember we said full-time is 35 hours a week they're much more likely to go from maybe working 45, 45 hours a week before to doing a few things that are different. One is to uh, working uh, not only fewer hours, but finding a job that is closer to home so they can be more flexible. And we see this, the best way I think to understand the difference in the pay gap is to look at what happens with um, women who own their own businesses versus men who own their own businesses. So take two groups that are quite equal. They both have MBAs um, and, they, um, uh, and so they're committed obviously to work. The Rochester Institute of Technology studied both um, groups of men and women with both MBAs who owned their own business. Women earned only 49% of what men earned. And so the, the, the assumption when they started this was, wow, women who own their own business that will, you know, they don't have the discrimination of, um, you know, um, the discriminating male um, bosses. And so therefore they'll be valued more. They'll probably earn as much or more than the ma their male counterparts. And the answer was no. So the Rochester Institute of Technology then investigated that further. And they asked women and men, uh, which is the most important values for you in owning your own business? 72% uh, uh, of the men said the most important value for me was um, greater income. Only 29% of women said it was greater income. The women wanted so more time. They wanted time, they wanted yeah. flexibility, um, and they wanted safety also. Um, men were much less concerned about safety than uh, women were, which is why you know, all, you, all of your hazards- That's why Uber drivers make more when they're men, exactly. at least in part, yeah. And, and Higher risk tolerance. Yes, and I mean, if, and if you know, let's say you don't have a college education, or even a, you've dropped out of high school, and so if you're, you, you might um, get a job as a as a garbage collector. You have to get up early in the morning. Um, it's dirty. It's hazardous. Um, and yet, a female who um, is has an art degree, a master's degree in art, uh, may earn less than that garbage collector. Um, and partially, it's because you know people tend to need their garbage picked up more than they need a new piece of art. And so um, these are so many of the 25 differences that are um, between men and women. But the good news about this- How did we get to an estate, Warren, where the given 25 differences is a lot of differences, and it doesn't make for a very big difference in pay, by the way. Um, even the most radical proponents of the unequal pay theory are struggling to come up with a figure that exceeds 15%. So 25 differences amounting to 15% isn't that much of a difference. Um, but, you know, if the data are so clear that it's fathers who are driving this and it's relatively self-evident, I would say, if it was single guys that were driving this, you could make a case that it was for selfish, um, pleasure-seeking purposes, right? And that would fit pretty nicely into the privilege narrative, right? Power, hungry, greedy, selfish, short-sighted, men with privilege make more money. It's like, well, wait a minute, it's fathers. Oh, so why are they doing that? Well- And, and never married women who have never had children earn 117% of what mar never married men who have never had children earn. Never married women who have never had children, they are more likely to plan for their careers and they do earn more. And what's most astonishing is that never married women who have never had children have earned more than never married men who have never had children since the 1970s. Just now it's 117% more. And so exactly what you said is true. Um, it is not 
uh, the, uh, uh, never married women uh, with, with never, who have never had children, they tend to focus on their careers, whereas never married men who have never had children, they're much more likely to be able to do something like music or art. Or, and, um, and, and gay men historically have often been very successful in art because they've been usually never married men who have never had children. And they've been able to afford to do things that were less likely and dependable to produce money. Oh, I've never heard that explanation before. That's that's uh, that's quite an explanation. So so let's delve into that a little bit more deeply. The the time and money issue. So when women rank order their preferences when they have options. So these are the middle class, upper middle class women you talked about. They're going to go for more time, and I presume that they want more time to spend that with their kids. That that's been my observation. That, that's the number one thing. Uh, if they okay. Don't, uh, they also and then men are making more money instead. But it's fathers that are making more money. So they're making more money for what reason? Is it like exactly? Is it for their kids? Is it for their wife and kids? Is it so that their wife maintains her attractive, their, her attraction to the man? Because that's a that's a big issue that no one ever talks about, right? I mean, within marriages, I've seen this many times. Within marriages, if the male takes a status hit, he also takes a attractiveness hit and it's a severe hit. I've seen this many, many times and no one will ever talk about it, but it's definitely the case. Here's the best way to understand that bridge. The man takes a status hit. Um, he starts losing respect for himself. His wife starts losing a little bit of respect for him, wondering whether or not that this is going to result in a job down the line or whether some promise or belief that he has is going to um, ma manifest. Uh, yeah, or if she's really the man he thought she was, she thought he was. He feels that less respect. And a woman, it's, and I think every woman will agree with this, it's almost impossible for a woman to love a man she doesn't respect. And there is, there's I think it's that the opposite is true too, but maybe the grounds for respect differ. The, the grounds for respect differ. Yeah. And also um, a, a man, uh, there's more flexibility with a man on the respect issue. There may not be more flexibility in terms of first falling in love on the beauty issue. Women have their burden that they have to, uh, that they have to live up to as well. Um, but the, uh, but on the respect issue, um, it's very challenging for if a, if a woman begins to lose respect, uh, she begins to lose love and men sense this and therefore they oftentimes brag or boast or, uh, or you know, uh, uh, or overstate their potential um, in order to be able to make themselves attractive. And we, we see this in so many levels on the Lois Lane level. Um, Lois Lane, you know, she had no interest in Clark Kent, uh, but she fell in love with Superman. And once she fell in love with Superman, she wanted Superman to be able to uh, cry and express emotions. But the man who did uh, uh, cry and express emotions and feelings and sensitive, Clark Kent, she has zero interest in. Um, you know, women are oftentimes say I'm opposed to war, um, but look at the, the, she's much more likely to fall in love with the officer and a gentleman than she is the private and the pacifist. Um, and you know, and they, they we, we talk about this even in high school. Most everybody's gone to high school, and most high schools have uh, football games. And um, and the and the women are the cheerleaders to go first and ten, do it again for the guy that scores the uh, touchdown, um, or cat, uh, either by throwing the pass or catching the pass. And if the guy feels like it's too dangerous for him to play football, and he leaves the football team, it's very rare that the, uh, the that the cheerleader says, you know. I noticed how well, how good your listening skills were when you were in the huddle and how warm and tender you are. I wanna continue cheering for you. No, she tends to cheer for his replaceable part. Uh, another number seven, um, risking his life um, with a concussion or a spinal cord injury. In well, this is non-trivial non um, behavior. I mean, because you look at the, the football team, I've been writing about that recently. The football example is particularly interesting, especially because it's such a trope in American, especially in American, popular yeah. culture. Everybody knows the story, right? Um, but what's so interesting too, is the men will on the team will elevate their best player to the highest position of status, despite the fact that they all take a hit in terms of sexual attractiveness by doing so. I mean, maybe, you know, being on a winning team elevates uh, a rising tide That's lifts all should. boats. Yeah. Well, yeah. definitely, but, but it's still the case that they'll take a uh, relative hit within the confines of the team to elect the man to the position where he's most likely to receive the favors of attraction from the most 
valuable, the most desired women. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, trying to puzzle out the role of sexual selection, thinking that through, because men, men select the women that, men select the men that women select. Absolutely. It's very, very interesting to watch that happen. And yeah, absolutely. And you'll, you'll see this, you know, both sexes figure out very carefully. And when people say, well, men are more competitive than women, that's not really true. Um, both sexes are very competitive uh, for getting, having the goodies uh, that lead them to be, have the greatest amount of choice. Uh, so women will compete with other women about how they dress, what their dresses look like. Uh, if, a, if a woman is at a party and, a, uh, and she's interested in one or two of the guys at that party and a really attractive woman comes through the door, uh, she will assess what her chances are and what, you know, what, um, how she should position herself to make sure she gets uh, the con contact with the man that she really wants to make contact with. And the men will do the same type of thing around um, you know, the things that they feel will lead a woman to be uh, attracted to them. Well, this also makes it very, it's very difficult for men to figure out, this is another reason why I question the long-term viability of, not, not that I truly question it, but these questions arise in my mind, the long-term viability of mixed sex workplaces. The rules for competing with other men are pretty clear. Mm -hmm. The rules for competing with women are not clear at all. Yes. Because if you're a loser, you're still a loser. But if you're a winner, you're just so easily a bully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it isn't obvious what, what, how men can negotiate that. Well, they have to negotiate it through negotiation. That's the only possible outcome. But it definitely makes things much, much more complex. And it's, it's also, it's complex, at least in part, because as you just pointed out, within the sexes, the competition is about different things. So, or be, sorry, between the sexes. No, no, within the sexes, the competition is about different things. So when a woman competes with a status, with, st with a man for status, she's competing for male status, not female status. And so what to make of that? Well, why that would be rewarding to her isn't that obvious. And I think that's part of the reason why so many women bail out of high pressure situations, jobs, when they hit their 30s. I mean, part of it is that they would rather be with their family and, and uh, for obvious reasons. But the, the, the other unspoken elephant in the room is always, well, why would it be particularly rewarding for a woman to attain status in the masculine hierarchy? What, what benefit does that confer on her? Well, more income, that's one of them. But that confers no attractiveness advantage, whereas for men, it, it accrues a tremendous attractiveness advantage. It's definitely disproportionate male versus female. I would say though, that if, two, if a woman is, if a man has a choice between two women and they're both equally attractive and their personalities are pretty much the same, et cetera, and one is more successful than the other, the man is likely to be more attracted to the more successful woman, but he's also likely to be afraid of rejection yeah, right. by that yeah. more successful yes, woman. Yes, definitely, he definitely. He will feel that that more successful woman will have more options uh, then she will have more options. She will have more options. And she'll have higher demands as well, and, because she's going her, to want to make, that's the real issue is the, that's where the rejection issue comes in. It's not even necessarily that she has more options. It's that because she's more successful, her criteria for what constitutes acceptable are going to be elevated. They may even be elevated to the point of impossibility for her. Exactly. And, and the real fear that the man has is the fear of being rejected. Yes, definitely. And I, I, I think that, 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 well, I've made light of that uh, by teasing my, my class, my, 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 my students, you know, I said, well, what's the, what's the, old, what's the joke? Well, you're, you're perfectly suitable as a companion, but in no way should your genetic material be allowed to propagate itself into the next generation. Right. That's, that's the core of rejection. And it's no, it's, it's, it cuts to the bone. It cuts to the bone, and I, 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 it isn't obvious that 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 that's sufficiently understood. How terrified men are of female rejection. Well, that's part of the turning to pornography, I would say, and the advantage of dating sites like Tinder because the rejection is taken out of the game essentially, or it's hidden, masked. Tinder is a is a revolutionary technology because it alters the the reward structure, reward and punishment structure in dating. I mean. It's a uh, it's incendiary and named properly.
pornography is basically access to a variety of attractive women without fear of rejection at a price you can afford. And right, and with with the with the commensurate responsibility, yeah, none exactly, exactly. except to yourself, right? But that's easily foregone in the moment. And the challenge of it is that the more so, boys who are usually doing less, young men who are doing less well in school, who are not the who who are not the football players that are getting the you know, fifteen different women coming up to them and risking rejection, um, who are not the um, student body presidents, who are not standing out in one way or the other, who are not getting great grades, not part of the honor society, et cetera. Uh, the the non standout men, the ones that are oftentimes um, dad deprived. Uh, that have mi minimal postponed gratification and so on, and they tend to do badly in school or drop out of school, uh, those boys feel like losers and they, they know that women tend to not date losers, they tend to date winners, and, um, and they end up in the um, unemployed and what women are looking for, um, for God, uh, and, and much more likely to be in their families, um, live with their families, 66% um, more likely. Oh yes, that's another statistic. Young men between 25 and 31 are 66 percent more likely than young women to be living with their parents. Yes, and more and, young men are living with a parent than with a partner. Yes, and they and you don't find women um, looking um, in their uh, you know, looking for men that are living in their parents' basement or looking for men. No, well, that's just a joke, which is why you you know you could insert it there as a cliche. Everyone understands exactly what that means. It means failure to launch. It exactly. means Peter Pan. Right, it's, it's a joke, and, and 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 those women are therefore more like uh, those guys rather are much more likely to turn to pornography because um, they they sense they're being rejected by women, um, and then they turn to this beautiful woman that they can be turned on by. The challenge with pornography is that the more you get into it, the more you tend to be stimulated by more and more risky things and more and more salacious things, or you know, or things that are that yeah. Aren't. Well, that's because novelty enhances enhances pleasure. So that's the addictive element of it. Precisely. And then the female who is interested in that guy um, and does come over to, you know, to be with him physically, um, she often feels like this guy is like, you know, more interested in something that happened in the pornographic um, things that he's been watching. She feels like an object, um, like, uh, and because she is being treated like an object. She well, and also those are the men who aren't going to be particularly sophisticated in their their treatment of women, because how can they be? They have no experience. Precisely. And so the, the pornography ends up haunting them on multiple levels um, and, and, and leads them to often turn back to pornography to avoid continuing rejection and only convinces them that a real life woman is somebody uh, that he would uh, fail on one level or another with. And so it's a really... Um, have you ever seen Robert Crumb's representations of bird-headed women? No, you, no, I haven't. Robert Crumb's an underground cartoonist, and he was the feature of a documentary, which you should, you and everybody else who's listening to this should definitely watch. Huh? It's it's absolutely it's the best documentary I've ever seen about anything ever. It's and he he draw, draws these women. They're pro, he was a loser in high school by his own admission, by every single category you could possibly generate, and so it's a study in loser psychology. But it's really complex because he was a loser who was extremely intelligent and unbelievably creative and who had two brothers who were probably more intelligent, more creative than him, although also more psychopathological. And then he became successful. He was one of the establishers of, of underground cartooning back in the, in the 1960s and, 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 and spawned arguably even graphic novel. You know, I mean, he's, he's a major player in that, in that niche. And, and, the documentary is a brilliant analysis of the relationship between failure and success and sexual failure and sexual success. Because in one memorable scene, he talks about, he drew this card when he was a high school kid of a heart being ripped apart when he got rejected by this girl that, that or by all girls. He said he was beneath contempt. He, could, he wasn't even in the category of comprehensible dating partner. Right. He was outside the game entirely. So he's rejected by the feminine as such. He draws these pictures of bird headed women with teeth, you know, and they're powerful, big thighs, big, big, uh, big rear end, like powerful, physically powerful, intimidating women like mothers draws sometimes these characters of little tiny men 
climbing up the legs of these huge tree-like women, but they're very aggressive and, 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 and uh, domineering. And the reason for that, at least in part, is because every woman he ever approached was rejecting and aggressive in the extreme, treated him with nothing but contempt. And then he says in an unbelievably memorable piece of the documentary, um, that all changed when I got successful. And you can just hear the resentment and the bitterness in his voice, even though it did change. And he wasn't that old when he became successful. He was in his mid-20s. You know, plenty of time to be on the outs completely and to experience life at the bottom of the male dominance hierarchy and, and even farther down the female dominance hierarchy, let's say, in terms of desirable men. It's, uh, it's called Crumb, the documentary. I would highly recommend it. And it's, it's absolutely brilliant study. And, and he had... Well, he had an authoritarian father and an uh, indulgent mother, and she plays uh, a key role in the documentary. And uh, it's, it's awful. It's, it's awful. It's, a, it's a, a study in Freudian psychopathology that's deep beyond belief. I've seen it like 40 times, showing it to my classes and walking through it clip by clip. But But anyways, it's a study. You don't see the world from the perspective of down and out male loser. You know, there are subcultures that, that sort of exist there, but this is, the, this is the only examination of that place in the world I've ever seen that I thought really, really nailed it. The, the documentarist was a friend of the family, so he, and Charles Brothers, one of them ended up a sexual offender who lived on the streets of San Francisco and the other committed suicide by drinking furniture polish when he was like 55, after being bullied terribly in high school and living in his mother's basement, essentially, for his entire life. Ugh, awful, awful. But, you know, you watch the documentary, it's not, it's not like people really, there's, you, you generate some compassion for the people in the documentary and what they've gone through. But I wouldn't say that compassion is what's primarily elicited by the documentary. And that goes back to this discussion we had right at the beginning about, you know, what kind of, empathy we have for the men who aren't making it? And the answer seems to be very, very little. Let's go to social policy with that. We might ask, okay, in light of this, what do we do? And I would say this is what I've recommended. I've recommended to young men that they take, that these are the facts on the ground and they're not going to change. And that if you're being rejected chronically by women, or if you're terrified out of your mind about that, and and perhaps rightly so, you should take a good hard look at yourself and see what it is that you have to offer. And so like, are you as educated as you could be? Are you working? You know, are you looking for a job at least? Are you trying to get out of your parents' house? Are you taking the steps necessary to become gainfully employed, productive, generous, and attractive? And, you know, that tangles us back up with something we also talked about in the beginning, which is the criticisms that have been directed my way by men, which is, well, you're asking men to live up to a stereotype that essentially um, undermines and devalues the vast majority of them. You're part of the problem, not part of the solution. And your emphasis on uh, responsible marriage, given the state of current family law, is nothing short of reprehensible. And so, you know, my approach is do what you can at the individual level to put yourself in the game. But there's there's much more to the story than that. Absolutely. This is really complex because I, the, the good news is there's a lot you can do to choose a, a woman who is the right woman. Um, and so, for example, uh, uh, looking at uh, when, when you go both, both go out to dinner, um, does she, is, is she open to paying? Is she, if she, if she isn't paying, does she, does she cook a dinner for you the next time around? Um, how does she treat the waiter? Uh, somebody that can't do her um, any, any good. Uh, ask her about her uh, former relationships, um, how they broke, um, how they broke up and who was at fault? Was, is there any accountability and responsibility on her part? Of course, ask these same questions of yourself as well, especially about uh, former relationships and how they broke up. Um, and um, and so that's, um, so choosing the right woman is probably- and so what are you looking for there? You're looking for um, generosity. You're looking for kindness down the hierarchy, right? So that's how does she treat people who are 
social inferiors, so to speak, at least in that context, like waiters. And then with regards to previous relationships, is she capable of some self-analysis or is, is it always the guy's fault? That reminds me of that Atlantic Monthly article, one of them. I'm unfortunately can't remember who wrote it, but it was this woman in her late 40s detailing out all the high quality men that she had rejected, many, many, many men by her own um, account. And during the entire article, there wasn't any recognition whatsoever of any time when it might have been her. It was like, I re these 40 men didn't live up to my standards. It's like, well, after the fifth one, didn't you start thinking maybe the problem was on the other side of the dating table? But the answer was obviously no, and she was obviously still single. So, but, so what are you looking for there exactly? And why did you, why did you bring that up at that point? Uh, well, because the, the, one of the ways that you can be involved in the game of marriage in a way that is positive um, is by making the, the choice of the woman differently than what we tend to do. Uh, we, uh, many men look at a woman, she's beautiful, and, um, and our desire to be sexual with her uh, leads us to sort of, okay, we'll pay for dinner, we'll promise this, we'll go, we'll go here, we'll go there. And yes, then, we should point out too, I just wanna yes. point out something. I talked to Randy Thornhill recently, one of the world's preeminent biologists. And before we get to thinking that this sexual attractiveness is nothing more than mere shallow mindedness and impulsive gratification, is all the cues of sexual attractiveness are tightly associated with physical health and fecundity, which is the ability to procreate. And so even if men are blinded by beauty, which, which I do believe is true enough, their reasons for that at the deepest possible level still have to do with the desire to continue the human species. So it's, it's shallow in one sense, but not in another. But your point is there are other markers that are characterological that are more subtle that need to be taken into account. Yes, both sexes have very um, huge reproductive draws. I mean, every from an insect right on up through human be beings, women tend to procreate and have children with the, with the, uh, the alpha male. You know, a good example of this is buck elks. And among buck elks, um, the females, 85% of them will have um, reproduced with the, with the male that has the biggest rack. Um, but the, and that, but the, what it takes to get that biggest rack is uh, an exhaustion of 30% of the minerals, nutrients, and uh, calcium um, in the buck elk. Uh, so the second that he reproduces, if he doesn't get rid of his rack immediately, he's likely to die before winter sets in and he's able to replenish the, um, the nutrients and the, and the minerals and so on. So his, his, his uh, rack was very productive for being able to procreate. It was very productive for being able to attract the female, but it was also his weakness. That is, and that's very symbolic of men, that men's weak, weakness is our facade of strength. Um, because it was strength because we could use that rack or the not me but the buck elks could use that rack to you know to to get rid of other um, predators or people that were the female didn't want to protect the female when she was um you know creating the child and so on but once but he was also being used uh, for being part of the next generation's benefit of producing the next generation's machine. And as you said, when we, you know, when we, once we have children, we really live for the next generation. And so now then the, the next question becomes, as humans, are we, are, do we want to create more options for ourselves? And so, and are we at a point now where survival is mastered enough in the middle and upper middle class that we have with them then we are chosen merely for our success and i think the best um, explanation of that um, comes in uh, japan where the millennials in japan have a game called kuroshi and of course kuroshi means death at the desk or death from overwork and the the game each person has a little kuroshi figure and they compete to get to the top of the ladder it might be the political ladder it might be the economic ladder it might be the religious ladder and uh, and as they compete to get to the top of the ladder, the one who gets to the top of the ladder first commits suicide, not in real life, but in the game. And the point that the Japanese millennials are communicating with each other um, is that, the, um, that what we did to become that successful man 
who was a, who was the most attracted, uh, who was the most able able to be eligible for sex and for love, um, is we unbecame a human um, doing, um, go, climbing to the top of the ladder. Um, I was, uh, and we, I'm sorry, we unbecame a human being. We didn't even think of ourselves as a human being. That's why we're committing suicide. We have just just by competing to be at the top of the ladder, we've worried about what position we wanted, how to how, working more hours, um, pleasing the boss, boss, pleasing the corporation, um, not not selling something we wanted or doing something we wanted, and we we've lost. We, we never even considered ourselves as a human being, and so now we Japanese millennials are going to start uh, looking at the um, the loss of ourselves as human doings, uh, uh, loss of ourselves rather as human beings. And that is, um, I, and, and that's the, in my opinion, the where we need to consider going. That as we have children, we're, there's this balancing act um, of do our, um, of helping our children see uh, the value of being that artist, that painter, that's you know doing what you love to do, combined with is it creating enough income to be responsible to your family to do that. And, um, and, and, and yes, it will lose you some, some women, but if you're developing emotional skills and, and emotional intelligence, uh, that may not attract as many women as the football player that risks his life and spinal cord injury, but it may attract the type of woman you want. And be, for me, between marriages, when, when I would um, go out uh, with women, I, they would, you know, I would share with them what I did, um, but part of that was sort of redefining equality for them. And it was not offering to pay for the bill, the whole bill on the first date. It was um, talking to them about the options, like I can pay on the first date and maybe you can do something like cook dinner for me on the second date uh, type of thing. Um, but I'll tell you many, many times I feared, uh, not many times I feared, I know a few times that I said something like that, um, that I knew that there was going to be no sex that evening, whereas otherwise it probably would have been. And so, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a risk that you take inside of yourself. Um, but for me, what I wanted to select for uh, was a woman who wanted me more for who I was and less for what status I had or what predictable status I had. So, well, what do you think? What do you think about the advice that I advise? I don't really think I give advice exactly. I'm trying to explore ideas and that exploration has certain consequences, but certainly, you know, I do, and as is my role as a psychologist, I do, you know, encourage the people who are reading me to do what they can with what they have to the best of their ability. And I don't see that we have a, a, a truly viable alternative to essentially classic sex roles I know they're under pressure for all sorts of different reasons, including the ones that you've outlined. But, but you know, in some sense, it's it's the only game in town. Now, what can I mean? There are th things we can do, though. You talked about um, the Japan, for example, where they've really um, invested heavily in vocational training, which seems to me to be a no-brainer. It's like maybe without having to revamp the entire relationship between men and women, we could say, well, wouldn't it be good social policy for everyone concerned to pay some attention to the vast majority of men who could use vocational training, for example, as an avenue to success in all domains of life? And why are we so unable to do that when the Japanese can do it? Yes. And we, we really are, there, there are so many things like that that we can do. I mean, schools, for example, um, we could have uh, one of the things I've suggested to the White House, both under the Trump administration and also under the um, Biden administration is starting a male teacher corps um, in which um, men uh, are trained to be teachers, particularly in dad deprived areas, uh, school districts, and, um, an and they get free scholarships, um, they get full scholarships uh, for college, but yet, in exchange for that full scholarship for college, they have to serve three or four years as a teacher in a, dad, in an, in, in a school district that has few male teachers. Um, another thing I've suggested to both both. And so you think that's, I'm thinking of objections to that selection on the basis of gender, let's say, which I'm, you know, pretty much temperamentally opposed to, but in some sense, but this, this is a data-driven suggestion. 
the data suggests that there are areas that we, so it's differentiated. It's not ideologically driven. It's a differentiated solution. There are, there's data indicating that the provision of male role models in places that are deprived of those, um, the addition of male role models in, in the domains that are deprived of those would be of benefit to everyone concerned. And so that's a targeted social policy. Yes. It's not I mean an ideological statement. Precisely. And in fact, it's even more complex than that. The way that I've suggested it is that you don't just get males like me. I, I consider myself more of a um, nurturer, connector male. Uh, you also get more traditional males so that, that no matter who your son is, um, if, you're, if you've grown up in a home without a, 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 a male role model in the home, without a biological father, particularly in the home, that, you have, that your son, no matter what he's prone toward, what his unique self is, um, that he's able to um, go to school. To find a role find, model. Find a role model that is, that is not just another nurturer, connector male, um, but you know, a, a construction worker or um, a, a, a man that's retired from a, a more of a, um, um, a, a profession that was more traditional, like a logger or whatever, firefighter, and um, that your son is able to see that possibility and then also the nurturer, connector male. Um, as a possibility, and so that those things be uh, offered. Another suggestion that I, I think is by far the most important one that I made to both um, administrations um, is the, the importance of creating a father warrior program, W-A-R-R, um, and, and because every gener you know, historically speaking, as you, as you read in the Boy Crisis book about the purpose void that men have, um, if by not, no longer being as needed as, as soldiers and no longer need, being as needed as full-time breadwinners, uh, that, the, that, the, that the male have the option of seeing himself um, as, po as possibly in, involved in um, some, and I, I lost where I was going with that. Um, you, you were talking about the male warrior idea and, oh yeah. and the need for right. purpose and the social policy associated with that. Yes, and so I, I, uh, what I've suggested to both um, White Houses is the importance of creating a father warrior program where we're saying we need young men to be full, uh, fully involved, uh, learn all the traits of being a responsible, emotionally connected father. Uh, we need women to, to value this in men as well. Um, uh, and so and how would that work practically speaking? Like uh, I'm always thinking about incentives. Like if we wanted to incentivize young men to be responsible fathers, which I think is exactly the right role to be playing in every, virtually every role that a man plays is the role of responsible father. That's the right role. Not everyone, but virtually everyone. How do you incentivize that at the level of social policy in, in, a, in a practical way? The number one thing you do is you honor it. Um, so, for example, when we had each generation had its war, and we said, Uncle Sam needs you. When men are told they are needed, that gives them purpose, that gives them drive, that gives them honor. When okay, so how do we, okay, so how do we um, say, fathers, you are needed, without saying, single mothers, you're inadequate? Because that's the killer, right? That's the killer right there, because one implies the other, or that's the theory. So, you know, and this is a, this is a shoal upon which our culture is, is wrecking itself, is how do we reward behavior that is eminently pro-social in the broadest possible sense of the word, without punishing, simultaneously punishing those who are excluded from that, but struggling to do the best under the conditions that have presented themselves to them. Absolutely. We, we say to mothers two things. One is we honor mothers for being just overwhelmed. I mean, I've never, uh, between marriages, I dated a number of, almost all the women I dated were women who had children. The word that they used most frequently was overwhelmed. Um, and, the, and so many of the mothers, I tended to, to date very bright women. And so they often felt caught between, they could do better in work. They could go further. They could go farther. Uh, they weren't up to the, their full level, but and they could do better as mothers. They felt guilty as mothers that they didn't have enough time for their work, and they didn't have enough time. To yes, yes, guilt all the time. They're, whatever they're doing is inadequate. 
Exactly. Because they're not spending enough time with their kids and they're not spending enough time on their work. And both of those are true in some sense. Absolutely. And when they would, they would say, I, I want to spend more time with you, but I'm caught between my work, uh, my, um, the other uh, right. children and, and, and my, and my love interest. And so, um, and so what the, the, the larger social message that needs to come out, come, come out to men is men, women need your help. Women do not, uh, should, need, need not, we must not leave women uh, to feel like they have- So is it women or mothers? But mothers, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's okay. I mean, it's just, it's important to get it right, right? I mean, absolutely. women, you might not need men's help. Mothers, you do. And so do your children. Right, exactly. So that you're, so that when you focus on mothers being overwhelmed, every mother hears that. When you say to a mother, when a mother hears, we're now going to be emphasizing the importance of dads getting in there to balance the picture with you, to help you out, to be, to 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 not have you have the entire burden. Mothers do hear that in a positive way. If you are simultaneously saying, which I think is 100% true, that you have just been that you've been overwhelmed and you've been, we respect and honor the fact that you've 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 taken so much responsibility, um, but it is not helpful for you to have to be pulled in so many directions. It is not helpful for the children. It's not optimal for the children. It's not optimal for the children, um, and it's not helpful for the dad because the dad is experiencing a purpose void of feeling not needed and unwanted. And men with purpose voids uh, tend to uh, look for a purpose. And, yes, tend to um, mm -hmm. look for a purpose and or um, look for uh, be uh, be negative sometimes in their purpose. And we yes, need, definitely we need to help mothers and fathers in the whole country understand. Okay, you know, so this sounds great. So why the hell don't you have any traction with Trump or with Biden? Because that pretty much exhausts the options. So yes, what's yes. going on? Well, I, I you know with with Trump, they uh, the Trump administration said they were very excited about it. They uh, asked me to write up a speech that Trump would give, and he never gave it. Um, and so um, with any the idea why? I mean. You'd think it would have been useful to him. You, you'd think, given his constituency. I would have thought it would have been 100% useful to him. I, you know, I made the case that there are about 20 million parents that have children, uh, that um, uh, boys rather, uh, that are in failure to launch mode in some way, shape or form. And that these mothers care more about their sons than they care about their party label, uh, that this could open an entire- For themselves maybe and, even. Yes, exactly. And I said this to both the Biden administration and the Trump administration. Uh, the Biden administration was at least you know, the 14 people that I met with at the White House and with HHS, uh, they said uh, they were very all to a person extremely enthusiastic. Uh, with the Democrats, I've gotten much more of a, resi a resistance um, when the White House Council on Gender Policy uh, was created. And I objected to that, not including boys and men and fathers, um, and, uh, and said that you couldn't possibly say you were in a favor of diversity and, and inclusion when you excluded fathers and, and boys and men. And then they said that there it's were, only fifty percent of the population. Yes, yes, or forty-nine percent, whatever. Uh, but you know, but it, it's one thing if you just say boys and men are not important. It's another thing to say I'm in favor of diversity and inclusion, and then to say that the second mission of the Gender Policy Council um, is to have racial justice, and not understand that racial justice can that the single biggest group of people who are having challenges in the in the culture are black males, and you know if you if you go to a home a city. Which is a prime example of the intersectionality that's being touted as crucial to the development of our entire culture. Yes, yes. And here- uh, or so It's the prime example, perhaps. Indeed. And here- the, Because I think black women are outperforming black men on average. In almost every metric. Yes, They're yes, exactly. Men. So, so, you know, well, that does beg the question. And, I mean- well, and, What question does it beg? Well, you know, maybe one question it begs is where exactly is the systemic racism? The, the, the racism. To use a horrible uh, phrase. The, yes, I, I don't even want to go to systemic racism. But if if the if the goal of the White House Gender Policy Council um, is to have racial justice, as it says it is, then you would. Uh, but then they go ahead and exclude. Uh, black males from racial justice and only focus on black females, 
that is undermining racial justice because the, as we know since the 1965 with the Moynihan report, um, the, when we did studies of inner city crime and the fear when um, Patrick Moynihan went to do that study was, oh my goodness, he's gonna be blaming black people, he's gonna be racist. In fact, he ended up finding that it was not blacks per se uh, that were creating the crime. It was just that one 25, at that point in history, in 1965, it was only 25% of the children who were being raised in, in families um, were without father involvement. And almost all of the crimes that were being committed were from the, the dad deprived children. Well, now- Yeah, the, that hasn't changed. That, that, well, that hasn't changed except one thing has changed the percentage of children who are raised in, in dad deprived mode in the black community has, has gone way up 25%. What do you think of the counter arguments to that, that have been raised recently that black men are just as involved with their children. It's just that it's in ways that the, you know, privileged white community, Jesus Christ, isn't recognizing. And that that's just another form, that idea that, you know, the black father is less engaged is just another racist trope. No, some black fathers, there are um, a significant number of black fathers who are involved with their children. That is not where those children, that those are not the children that are having problems as long as the black mother is also involved with the children. Um, so when, whenever you have that, um, and, and of course the, the social policies we were talking about before, you know, the, of, of giving money to the women, infants, and children program, another program where the, the female who didn't, uh, the black female or the white female who did not have um, a father in the home, she would be helped. And if the father was not in the home, that did reinforce very significantly um, the propensity of the mother to say, let's say the father wasn't earning very much money. So the father would, if you, if you live away from me, um, we'll be able to get government support. And so then that right. incentive um, for living right. away. Watch your incentives. Right. And we have to realize today, it's not just that the um, African-American families now have more than 70% of the children who are raised with minimal or no father involvement or what I call dad deprived children. But also at the time of the Moynihan report in 1965, there was only 3.2% of Caucasian families whose children were living in dad deprived situations. Now that's gone up to 35% in Caucasian families. And so we had this enormous dad deprivation. And in, it's in these dad deprived uh, families that um, watch what's going to happen in the fall. We're going to have significant numbers of school shootings. And one of the things that we see with school shooters um, in, the, in the 21st century, every school shooter who shot, shot 10 or more um, people, killed 10 or more people, every one of them was dad deprived. Um, we, um, when, we look at, when you look at the prison population, it's 93% male, and the great majority of those males are um, dad deprived males. Um, I, I think I, I've never experienced something that was more touching for me than when I ran for governor and I spoke of California and I spoke around at a few prison populations and I talked to these prison populations, almost all male. The first question I would ask is, you know, how many of you had an involved father and about three or 4% of the hands of the prison population would, would go up. And then I would talk to them about, about all the, the, the things that dads do that are different from what moms tend to do, like the teasing, like the postponed gratification, like the rough housing, and what the psychological value of those were for the children's growth and development. And I had these guys with tattoos and um, you know, and muscles that I'll never have uh, coming up to me and saying, crying and saying, I never realized I was worth anything. I thought I was better off probably in prison because I was the worthless per person in the family. And suddenly for the first time, I'm feeling like I want to get out of prison to help my children uh, not have the problems that I had and not, go and, and not make the mistakes that I made. Um, and so there's this enormous desire on the part of men to know that they're valuable as fathers. You know, you know my, my sense as a clinical psychologist has always been that a kid has to have one role model sometime in their life to, to make it. They have to have someone to mimic or they can't make it. Now, you can get that a variety of ways. I remember reading Angela's Ashes. It's a great book by Frank McCourt. And his dad was a recalcitrant alcoholic who drank the family's livelihood and health away. It was awful. Uh, but he kind of separated his dad into good 
dad and bad dad, and bad dad was drunk evening dad, and good dad was sober morning dad, and he got his mimicry from good sober morning dad, you know, so you can, you can pick it up in bits and pieces from different places. But if you're, even if you have an intact nervous system, you know, and you're not suffering from burdens right at the point of your birth, from, from deprivation that's, that began before you were even around, you need to have at least one model in your life that shows you what the good version of you could be, because otherwise, how the hell do you know what it is? And it needs to be embodied, right? So you can see it play itself out. So then you can play with it. Yes, absolutely. Let me, and let me, to that effect, let me address the, the females in the audience here listening to this that are single moms and, and, and what can you do? So the number one thing that, can, that you can do is take a look at the differences between dad style parenting and mom style parenting, because oftentimes the things that dads do look like they're not caring about the children, the things like teasing, the things like roughhousing, the things that letting the children take risks, like you know climbing the trees, like we talked about. They all seem like um, this, the tough love decisions are often seen, you see the toughness without the love very frequently. And so um, take a very careful look at that. Make sure that if you're still, if you still have the dad at all around or available, that you get into family dinner night discussions where everybody um, learns how to listen to everybody else's perspective in the family, uh, learn how to do a negotiating of that 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 uh, checks and balance parenting. But if it's absolutely impossible to get the biological father involved, and I'm afraid that the biological father, children do better with the biological father than they do with the stepfather, mostly for the. Step parent elevates risk for abuse by a hundredfold, if I remember correctly. It's a very um, stepfathers almost always are never allowed to be more than advisors. If you do have a stepfather, um, work on the, that issue I, that I talk about in the Boy Crisis book on how to engage the, sec, the stepfather as a real equal, assuming that he's a responsible and loving man. But if all those things fail. Um, make sure you get your child at the age appropriate time into Cub Scouts. Cub Scouts involve children involved in Cub Scouts for two or more years um, have a very significant increase in character development over children that are involved in Cub Scouts minimally um, and uh, or not at all. Um, Boy Scouts are a, a wonderful construct deconstruction of masculinity. They've really figured out how to bring out the best in boys. Um, Faith-based communities. Children who are in faith-based communities, make sure your faith-based leader gets your son involved with other, uh, in small groups, with other boys his age, and make sure he, he encourages your son to be, um, to, and all the boys in the group to talk about their feelings and their fears um, so that they can see that they're not alone in those feelings and fears. Make sure your children are involved in the, what I call the liberal arts of sports. But by the liberal arts of sports, I mean team sports, also pickup team sports, uh, which uh, and and also sports where you have to develop your own skills. It's you're part of a team, like in gymnastics or in tennis, um, but you're not uh, interacting with the team all the time. Each of those things will develop in your son different types of skill sets. The most important one that oftentimes moms don't realize the value of is the value of pickup team sports. Let your son or daughter be at, a, at, a, at, a, at the school without your supervision. Let them pick up a game where they have to decide without somebody supervising them um, how big the court should be, the basketball court should be, should be half size, full size. What are the fouling rules? Who do you che uh, uh, check? It's perfect um, developmental skills for being an entrepreneur and being, um, being able to make decisions without supervision. Uh, obviously, team sports are pretty obvious what their benefits are and, um, and be developing skills without that, that aren't dependent on this team are part of the liberal arts of sports. So spend time in the Boy Crisis book with looking at what you can do as a single as a single. Yeah, mom. well, one of the things I liked about your books and, and why men earn more as well is that they're they're full of information, but they're also practical. And they have practical advice. Here's things you can actually do, which is something people apparently appreciate about my books. So it's nice to have it detailed down to the level of action. I want to close because I know we're we've exhausted you. Um, what? Why did you receive such 
I would like to know why you think you didn't get more traction with the Trump people, but then I would like you to tell me what's up with the Democrats. Why didn't you get, why did you get rejected so out of hand when you put forward these perfectly reasonable propositions, which in principle should be in accordance with what they're claiming to support? Yes, even the Trump people, this is what I'm going to say now is 10 times, tenfold this issue with the, the Biden people. But even the Trump people were fearful that the single mother would feel criticized and they were afraid of losing that the support from her. And um, and so that was that was what I heard behind the scenes was the the gap between um, it being very much recommended by the people that I spoke with versus actually having a, a, a presentation delivered by Trump. The other thing was that uh, they were fearful that it would it would call attention to Trump's failed marriages and um, and his his womanizing, and they didn't want to open that door. So those were the okay. two. Okay. Uh, okay. From the Trump side, from the Biden side, um, it was like it was well. The best example of this is when I went to Iowa and I interviewed um, nine of the presidential candidates that were Democrats. And most of them um, were very excited, especially Andrew Yang and um, um, uh, Senator Hickenlooper, John Hickenlooper, were very excited about what I was saying. Andrew Yang already had a mastery of what was um, a pro what the problems were with boys. He, he was on the tip of maybe being able potentially to talk about the issue. Um, while when I finished talking with both Andrew Yang and um, and Hickenlooper, um, especially with Andrew Yang, the female. Um, uh, campaign manager came up to me and said, I'm sorry, Warren, we just cannot have him talk about these issues. This will alienate our feminist base. This will alienate uh, women who are single moms. Um, it will not, um, and we want, we want also many of the women who are divorced, we want them not to feel that they won't have the choice of going off and, and starting a new life and bringing their children to a new location with a new man. Um, and so we are afraid of losing that bait, those two. Yes, well, and to hell with the old man. Yes. And so it was really, um, and, and they were honest with me. That's the good news. The bad news is they were, you know, the, um, th this was the case. And so with the, when the Biden administration um, created the White House Gender Policy Council, which was a day or two before he was actually inaugurated, um, the um, and it was focused on you know women and girls and um, you know and and both black women and girls and white women and girls. I protested and um, and talked with Jen Klein, who's, who's the co-chair about this, uh, many times. And her only answer over and over again was Warren. Um, uh, President Biden cares about men and boys. Warren, what, President Biden cares about a fa the fathers. And my response, my my constant hammering of her about. Well, then, then it should be written into the White House Gender Policy Council to create these father warrior programs, to create these um, uh, these programs of dozens of which I suggested uh, that could um, increase and improve the lives of boys and men. And I was met with no answer, like just. So what? what's the problem? What's the problem as far as you're concerned? We might as well have it right out. What the hell's going on? In, in Jen Klein's case, and in the um, in the in the feminist uh, in the the liberal political leadership, uh, in the Democrats, it is just a fundamentally and totally honest belief that um, women have it worse than men, that boys and men, and, and the the constant image that comes up for the political liberals is. Warren. Right. So it's the gen it's the classification of the world by sex that's the problem. It isn't who has problems and how do we help them. It's it's the classification first and the problem second. It's we live in a patriarchal world dominated by men who made the rules to benefit men at the expense of women. The proof of that Warren, yeah. is that um Look at who's at the top of the political ladder. Look at who's the top of the um, corporate ladder. Uh, look at who's the top of even the religious ladder. Right. So it's right back to where we started, which is identify that tiny minority of men who are hyper successful, generalize that to the masculine uh, universe at large, and to hell with those that are in the middle or the bottom, which is, so what is that hypergamy in female politics? Is it the same thing? And it's, it is not the realization that the men at the top are often at the top. They're earning that more money, not because they feel more fulfilled or this is their choice. 
they felt obligated to earn money that somebody else spent while they died sooner. Right. So it's not even true for the people who have the privilege, much less true for men anywhere else on the hierarchy. Correct. And when I say to them things like, you know, it isn't male privilege. Do you consider it male privilege for every um, generation during their war to train the boys and the men uh, to be uh, the ones that died in war so that you could be protected and, and saved? And it's just like closed mouth. Uh, what about the, um, the, the legislation? That's that become a real issue in Korea. Yes. In South Korea. I, oh, actually, I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, yes. Yes, there are no shortage of men who are not thrilled about the fact that they are conscripted for two years and the women aren't. Now, you know, my sense is, well, the women pay their dues in childbirth and, and pregnancy. And, you know, but nonetheless, it's it's an issue and it's producing no shortage of resentment and friction among young Koreans. And here in the United States, you know, it's still the law, um, which is probably the most unconstitutional law that most violates the 14th Amendment's equal protection laws. It is still the law in the United States that your son who's 18 must register for the draft. If he doesn't, um, he can be fined a quarter million dollars. He can be put in prison for a year or two. He can, he'll, in 42 states, he can lose his driver's license if he doesn't register for the draft. Um, he, and there's a whole series of other, he can never go to a school that gets federal money, which is virtually every school, including private schools. This is all the punishment that men have, male, your son has if he's 18 and doesn't register for the draft. The punishment for females is zero uh, because they don't have to register for the draft. They have the option to- So join. what do you think of that, Warren? Like they, the old fashioned patriarchal part of me thinks, I think two ways at the same time, you know, I, unfortunately about that. I think- you know, I do believe to, to some degree that that's the balancing of the scales, you know, that as you point in, out in your own book, you know, men die in war and women die in childbirth. Now, they don't die in childbirth so much anymore, but they did and and in, in great numbers and it was terrible pain and, and, and all of the privation that went along with that obligatory responsibility. Tremendous amount of that has been ameliorated. Not all of it, but a tremendous amount. Thank God for technological progress. And so, but, but having said that, well, it doesn't sit well. The idea of women drafted for frontline combat doesn't sit well with me. Yes, and I think there's an answer to that, which is we don't have to draft people for frontline combat. There are, there are, there are men that are not suited to that. There are women that are not suited to that. But we're either, um, but I think it's, it, what, a good solution would be either you don't have registration for the draft, which creates a different set of problems and not having a ready um, group ready, but say you, but you have people register at the age of 18 for some type of service of say six months or more. And, and, and then you, you mark off the type of service that your personality, that your, that your um, contribution can make. You could be a, a healthcare frontline wor worker. You can be a volunteer in this way or that way. Mm -hmm. So if there's mandatory service, it's mandatory for all, but the service itself can differ. And, and, and everyone could have some choice in that. And who knows, maybe there'd be enough people pick frontline combat to fill the necessary places. It's possible. I mean, there are people who are constitutionally inclined towards that. And if there isn't enough people for that, then you do a supply and demand type of phenomenon. You raise the income for the people who do um, mm -hmm. want to. Right, right, right. That are Which would be, that would, right, exactly. That would be the equitable way of dealing with it is, is increase the hazard pay. Yes, exactly. Right, and you'd watch the demand, in, you'd watch the supply increase. Exactly. Because there'd be people who are right on the line, right, right on the edge. Exactly. Right, 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 right. Any final things to say? Yeah, I guess maybe the most important thing I'd like us to all get is that there are so many things like hashtag me too that are so valuable um, to, for us to hear the pain and the experience that women go through. But hashtag me too as a monologue is a disaster because it needs to be a dialogue. Yeah, just like it needs to be a dialogue between men and women in a family. 
Exactly. We need to hear that that men have pain, men have all these, these you know, the, the 50 plus developmental challenges that I talk about, that men feel um, uh, lonely, isolated, that men, why men suffer more, um, because when, in, because one thing we need to do it just for compassion. Secondly, there's so many misunderstandings and anger that is happening by, we say on the one hand, men are, we have toxic masculinity. Um, they don't express their feelings. They don't say who they are. And then we, we make men pay an enormous price when they do express their feelings. And so, so many young men feel caught between a rock and a hard place. When yes, well, I would say that's happened in my case, you know, because I have this unfortunate proclivity to burst into tears at the slightest provocation, which has haunted me my entire life, but is still quite pronounced. And it isn't exactly obvious to me that you know, my radical left-wing critics are above using that as a weapon. It's quite interesting to note, you know, and maybe they're justified in doing so. I'm not saying that, That's, but that's it runs contrary to their hypothetical theory. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and you know, and I've said man after man, by the way, I have that exact same character as if my, if my wife were here listening now, she'd be really chuckling because um, anything that is you know, what I had to hold myself back when I was talking about the memory of the of the men in the prison population coming up to me afterwards and themselves crying. Um, but right, right. Yeah, I think you just about got me there too. <laughs> uh, interesting. The hashtag Me Too dialogue is is, is so important, not just for empathy, um, but also because to to eradicate the toxic part of masculinity that keeps feelings all to oneself. Because when you do that you end up having a, a volcano build inside of you and it comes out as the anger, it comes out as distance, it comes out as drinking, it comes out in destructive behavior. And it also comes out in things like school shootings, mass shootings, um, committing crimes. And so both to protect ourselves from the mass shootings, from the ISIS recruits, almost all of whom are dad deprived males and females, um, and also out of the- And uh, is, there data, is there data on that, Warren, with regards yeah, to the, recruitment I, for- Yes, there is. In fact, it was done um, by three sociologists who looked at um, the studied ISIS recruits in Lebanon. And after doing that, um, they anecdotally told each other afterwards, you know, a lot of these these guys have um, um, don't have their dads and they were trying to get involved with ISIS to have some sense of a, a purpose beyond themselves. Well, it was never part of our questionnaire. They went back and then did a systematic study of the men asking, including that question that had not been asked at the, at the beginning and found that to be the single most common denominator of the ISIS recruits. Um, by the way, there's 89% um, hmm. male ISIS recruits and 11% female ISIS recruits. And the females had dad deprivation as an issue, um, as well as the males as the single biggest um, characteristic. Patriarchal ideology as a substitute for paternal relationship. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And just mm -hmm. a need to have some sense of purpose and feeling yep. of, of being needed. And that's one of the things that dads are so good at as working with moms. Moms are so good at identifying a child's gifts, nurturing the child's gifts. And dads are so good at the tough love oftentimes that are necessary to help the child um, uh, achieve those gifts. Yeah, well, I thought, you know, it seems to me that the central characteristic of the benevolent paternal spirit parodied as the patriarchy is encouragement. Oh, encourage? Well, I would, I, said, I think I'd take a little bit of a different issue there. I think moms and dads both encourage a lot, um, but moms oftentimes uh, repeat the encouragement. And when the child fails, are still encouraging. Whereas the dads say, if you want to get to that outcome, you need to not do that texting. You need not to, you know, do all the things that that outcome requires. And they tend to sort of enforce those boundaries and hold the child accountable uh, to a greater degree. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. That's. Thank you very much for talking with me today, uh, Warren. It's, it's just a much, much appreciated. You don't exhaust me. You energize me. I just. Oh well, I'm glad still... to hear that, and and I hope that I hope that everybody finds this conversation useful. Thank you. Thanks again, Nate. Thank you, you too.